Good day, everyone. Today is, what is today? Today is Wednesday. I've lost track of the date. That's what happens when you're having fun. Uh, all kidding aside, what a day, my God. What a day. Um, you know, as we've said many times, trying to call the uh, market on a day-to-day -day basis is a fool's errand. The market has no institutional memory one day to the next. Increasing volatility. Uh, you know, they want to buy it. They want to sell it. There's nobody on the other side. We're going to go to t Tony Green in a minute to talk about to talk about what he sees going on. By the way, we have, just so you know, Mark Spiegel is going to be the featured speaker, but we were going to have Tony Greer kick it off for 10, 15 minutes, and then Guy is going to talk for about 10, 15 minutes about what they see going on. Because everyone's house is burning down, I'm sure one of the people know what they're thinking. We had a phenomenal room last week. Again, it was the the greatest Twitter space ever in history. And Michael Belkin, who's in the room, uh, was there. Tony Greer, Guy Serendulo, Three Aces, uh, Mike Kantrowitz, Tom Thornton, Dr. Anasa Haji. I mean, Jim Bianco. It was murderers, row. There's never before been a room like that in Twitter space history. And I don't know if we'll ever be able to outdo that. But just turn off Jim Cramer and CNBC. If your portfolio is going the wrong way, if it's going from the upper left to the lower right, and you just you can't figure it out, you don't know what's going on, just stop. It's like you know the Hippocratic Oath when you're, you're a doctor. The first thing to do is just do no harm. So there's nothing wrong with going to cash. As uh, Jesse Livermore once said, sell to the point of sleep. I'd like, I'm very proud of what this room has done uh, on so many fronts. The community that we've established, empowering people to learn more, increase their financial literacy, make better decisions. We don't give picks. We don't give out fish. We teach people how to fish. And I've just been overwhelmed by the support and the incredible feedback from people that we've gotten. Not to mention, not to mention, um, the incredible work we've done in charity. We're going to have Carol uh, Strone uh, speak up on that in a little while. That's some really, really exciting news to report. So without any further ado, let's get on with it. Um, so, Tony, I want to go to you first. And I know you've got a hard stop. So, Tony, talk for a few minutes, then Guy. And then I see we've got Michael Belkin in the house. So murderers are on the technical side. So if each of you guys want to let it rip for 10 minutes or what about, or I can ask questions. But, Tony, the floor is yours. Great to see you. Great call, Tony. Great call, Guy. Great call, Michael. I mean, you want to know the guys have been right and right for the right reasons? They're right here. Tony, take it away. Man, that was a dazzling intro, George. I really appreciate that. Um, let's go right into it, right? Uh, I have to talk a little bit about what happened last week because you got to look at what happened after the FOMC smoke cleared, right? We saw the dollar up, commodities up, bonds down, crypto slaughtered equities lower by order of big tech first. I mean, it's great rotation personified, right? And if you do some micro due diligence, you see we had four dive bomb days in the S&P surrounding that FOMC meeting. We had a cluster of huge tick index extremes on the downside as defined by being greater than minus 1500. We had this huge daisy cutter print minus 1900 Monday morning, intense selling, um, you know, guys calling bottom for the near term on FinTwit, et cetera, et cetera, all well and good. But, you know, the performance is still bad. Subsectors of tech last week, cybersecurity, software, Internet, cloud storage off over 5 percent to new lows. Meanwhile, back at the fossil fuel ranch, you know, with natural gas and diesel fuel go on 10 percent runs because there's no diesel fuel, 10 percent rally in XLE and XOP. Right. So this is the great rotation that I'm punting after, especially after the Fed throws another 50 basis point cigarette butt in front of the freight train. So today, um, you know, more of the same after we get the daisy cutter CPI number of 8.3 percent year over year. Right. Hourly earnings number imploding. Um, and the market just does a follow through in the reaction to FOMC week. Right. Bonds start falling again. Dollar goes bid again. Um, crypto gets crippled to a new low. I mean, some of these charts look like they can round trip to their 2020 lows, just like ARK and Square have. And, you know, Luna just did recently. I mean, Ethereum's off 43% year to date. Bitcoin's off 37% year to date. I, I, that doesn't get me excited. 
Um, when you look, I think that's wildly relevant to the stock market today. Apple notches its first 5% slide. I just tweeted this out since October 30, 2020. It, um, back then, it held moving average support at 110 and rallied $30. That would have been a good trade if you bought it. Um, but I'd warn people that back then, CPI was 1.2%. 10-year yields were 87 basis points. We had a different president in the White House. Uh, it seems a lot different this time. Also on the tape, we got a new range break lower in home builder Lennar. Obviously, going to be super sensitive to the fastest move higher in race that I know I've ever seen. I would probably, George, you probably agree. Um, you know, the home builders have been, you know, one of those sectors at the eye of the storm. You know, off 15 of the last 16 weeks this year, off 32 percent year to date, you know, likely going lower as yields rise. Um, you know, that's another short in the great rotation there, just being sensitive to rates as it is. And to me, the most important thing that's happened for the sort of commodity side of the great rotation is natural has natural gas held 650 again on the dip for the second time since breaking above it in April. Right. Um, to me, that's really relevant when commodities and bull markets hold their old highs like that. It just increases the chances that they can keep charging towards a new one. Um, you know, so this bounce to 760 now in natural gas helps get fossil fuels back on their feet. Uh, I keep a close eye on the March, April 2023 spread in natural as my sort of beacon for how stretched this winter month um, sort of hump in the curve is going to get as everybody tries to accumulate for the winter months. And this spread is holding its range in the dollar and a half, two dollar level. And I think, it, you know, it looks fantastic from here. As long as things like June, July diesel fuel are at spreads that are astronomical levels, I don't know, above $10 or something like that, they're currently trading about 20, that spread is currently trading about $20 because like I said, there's no diesel fuel. Um, that leads me to believe that this, you know, this energy trade is still on to the upside. Um, you know, and then just recently, man, you know, as long as the admin is still, you know, spitting in your eye about inflation and telling you it's raining, and not doing anything to sort of adjust course or, or, or make amends in any way about the batshit crazy energy policy. I mean, I don't know what stops the freight train that's in motion um, right now. So that's what I'm seeing in the markets. Uh, I, you know, once again, it leads, it leads you to recall, like, it's never been more important to adjust your portfolio. Because as this rotation picks up steam where, you know, you all of a sudden now, with the NASDAQ in a bear market and people saying, oh, Sid, markets, you know, everybody's getting very negative here. It seems like this could be a bottom. When people start thinking that, then all of a sudden there's a huge trend line break in Apple and a large magnitude move with a double top at 180 in the rear view mirror. It's like, oh, this thing can pull back 20% now, like with no problem to a technician, right? So when you've got index leading stocks like Apple breaking down in large magnitude, You've got other stocks like, you know, Square and Arc, uh, things like that, you know, completing their round trips to the levels essentially that they took off from. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that the selling is done. It just means that selling is getting maybe closer to done there. But the bottom line is, as long as, you know, the commodity side, the, the fossil fuel part of this trade is intact, the fundamentals are intact. The underlying spreads and the calendars are intact. I mean, this is a trade that I'm going to be hunting until it really burns my ass. So that that's really all I have for you, George, in terms of an update uh, on the price action and what I'm seeing. I'm happy to take a couple questions. I hope that was helpful. Extremely helpful, Tony. You cut to the chase, and we're going to follow up with Guy Serendula and then Michael Belk. I got one question for you, Yeah, which is really the thing that's bugging me the most. And, you know, people ask me, are you still bears? So I say, hell yes. And the reason is to quote the great Walter Deemer, it's not when everyone turns bearish uh, that's important. It's when people are done. It's when they're done selling. And my observation is, I think I said this to you, we had a brief call earlier today. Retail, you know, that over a trillion of inflows last year, it's remarkable. The data through last weekend showed only about 30 some odd billion of selling. So, you know, they've yet begun to, they've not yet begun to sell to, you know, paraphrase John Paul Jones. So, and then I look at the hedge fund data. If I see one more of these prime brokerage survey bullshit things where they say, well, you know, hedge fund exposure has gone from 75% net long to 45% net long. And on a five-year look back period, that's, you know, Z scored, it's like in the 3% or whatever. And I say, wait a second, dude, wait a second. You, 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 you th that is so misleading because 
you've got a regime change going on here. And, and, you know, if you go back further, go back to, say, 2010, let's not even go to the depths of the great financial crisis. I don't think 45 percent was was, 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 the, was the new normal then. So that's all in, in service of Tony asking you a question. And, and I know maybe you probably don't have any any hard numbers, but from your contacts at various major firms, what is your sense of that positioning right now, Tony? Well, you know, I, like I, I think I, I, uh, I wrote this the other day that, you know, it's like positioning is it, it i don't think we're at the end certainly you know and i'm not just trying to you know i i know you may be leading the witness and i'm not trying to go where you're leading me but it doesn't feel like you, there's been a capitulation of a serious magnitude yet like where you know somewhere you can see the whites of their eyes kind of thing right everything has been sort of orderly on the charts even though the moves have been steep but positioning wise you know, I, I still feel like probably the largest portfolio managers in the world are still long tons and tons of FANG stocks that, you know, they probably got getting closer to selling more of, you know, that that's the kind of thing where they finally get convinced. One of the things that's relevant is that it's, you know, some of the guys that study the CPI data know it may, way better than me, um, you know, point out that a lot of the street and everybody was really, really shy on this call, on the CPI call, like nobody had it being as bad as it is. And that leads me to believe that portfolios are farther away from where they need to get to, right? I, I, like you said, I can't give you exact numbers. I can't say, okay, the, the glass is full at 10 and currently it's trading, you know, still seven and a half on the way down with length. Um, maybe that's somewhat in line, but, you know, if this tank is going to get to below five and we're going to start heading to the point where, you know, retail is finally coughing things up, we're not even close to that yet. And, you know, the only stop, thing- Stop, go, stop, stop, go. stop. We're not even close to that yet. Do you want to repeat that again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not we're not close to that yet. I mean, there's still retail guys calling me up asking me what they should do. I've told them three calls ago that I don't know what else I can tell you um, besides it's different this time, except for our here, for example, the tweet that I put out today, right? The last time Apple rallied like this, uh, if tens were eighty seven basis points and CPI was one point two percent. And I say the guy that's calling me that doesn't want to sell it. If I tell you that the weather at the baseball game is CPI 1.2% and 10-year yields 87 basis points, and then we're going to another baseball game and the weather is CPI 8.3 and 10-year yields 3%, do you wear the same clothes? It's like, no, you, got, you, you, you don't. You got to, you know, right? You got to adjust, man. It's just, 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 you got to adjust. Don't be in the stock if the conditions changed around it like this. So people don't realize that, and that's, that's why I fear that we're not near the end. That's great, Tony. Listen, I know you had a hard stop. This is I awesome. Do. We keep it tight. We got a lot of other firepower here. We got Guy with Sarah Dulo. We got Michael Belkin. We got Tom Thornton. I see the great Jeff Hirsch is in the house, Mr. Almanac Trader. If he wants to come on up, uh, by all means, raise your hand. We'll get you up here. So, Guy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, Thank you, brother. I'm checking out. Yeah, you're welcome, Tony. <laughs> Good day. We'll catch up to you. Guy, the floor is yours. And then, Mike, for Give us like 10 minutes or so, and then Michael. Yeah, Duffin. great, great. You want to hear some good news? Sure. The good news is that we're probably halfway there in the S&P, so halfway there. <laughs> I'm only kidding, George. Okay. We, are, we, are, we, are, we are, I think, halfway there. So the funny thing is, um, you know, the work that I do is different than most technicians, and I don't want to go into all the detail, but it's based on supply-demand type of analysis. And look, the distributive pattern that unfolded, especially in the Russell 2000, the NDX S&P, and the CAC and DAX and the Italian market, FTSE, MIB, I mean, it's all in, set up in such a way that, you know, I'm looking at measurements in the NDX uh, from peak to where the, the I think, A low of some sort will, will happen is down 36%. The Russell 39, S&P 37. Uh, talking about the DAX, CAC, and FTSE, ironically, they all measure in the same space of 34 35%. So, you know, so, so, guy, 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 let me interrupt you. So yeah. that's is that I presume from where it started. Yes. So what does that imply about from where we are right now? Is that like oh, yeah. Of, you know? Well, we're halfway there. No, George, if okay. you flip the charts upside down, they're buys. I mean, they're bases or whatever, whatever you want to call them. But, you know, it's just difficult to find a, a reason technically that let's say the S&P should um, have a, a rally of magnitude from here. I mean, the, the distributive top in place, the negative money flow work that I see in that pattern alone suggests that any kind of near-term blip is a blip. Bottom line is when you're in a, 
a strong bear market. Your counter trend rallies tend to be one to three days in duration. And, you know, anything under three days, you know, that the, the selling pressure is such that you're going to take out the low in a meaningful way. So uh, the way I see things, you know, even Apple, you, you see, you see my work, you get my work. We work together. I share my stuff with you. Um, I'm thinking, you know, Apple has a four, from peak to trough, it's a 43% decline. There's a, a level around 29% from here. Now, the reason why I mentioned this is, look, I've been in the business for over 30 years, Fido 13, Wellington 10, and I've seen PMs that are you know, smart people, fundamentally oriented, MIT this and that or whatever, and you know they won't sell their Apple. Some of them were afraid to be underweight or afraid to be even equal weight because the weightings of the indices are such that they have to be involved. So I would bet you a buck that a lot of these PMs are not selling these stocks right now. I mean, it's probably you know ETF related. Who knows? Hedge funds, but the the selling pressure, like Tony was talking about, I don't see that puke right now. And and a lot of these guys are going to be. Look, I've seen people in twenty in the two thousand eight two thousand nine decline, and I worked at a big firm. They're managing billions. A lot of these people just write it down. And then pray to God that there's a trough and they ride it back up. It's like having okay, a so, 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 guys, so hold on. This is really interesting, different perspective that you could really uh, – so when you're institutional, so anyway, what, you got guys basically with their legs crossed or, they yeah. or with their heads just hiding under the desk, just just hoping that it will go away, that it will blow over? Yep, yep. I have one client right now, old colleague. Uh, he, he runs a long short portfolio, not net short, very f- couple of uh, tech shorts here and there, but afraid to put more on. So it's, it's really strange, George. I don't know how to explain it. But, you know, the reason why I'm not share the numbers is that, you know, even with the Tesla, you know, I have like a downside to 600, potentially to 450 on the stock. I just feel bad for the average Joe that's, you know, you know, buy the dip. Don't be a drip. You know, you have these people come on the boob tube saying, oh, you know, when you get these types of declines and these stats, six months later, you'll be up X percent. Yeah, but between now and six months, you could be down another 30 percent. So it's like, it's crazy. It's uh, it's sad. So the way I see things, we're about halfway there. Your U.S. indices, European indices, because I worked a lot with you know uh, developed markets, ex-U.S. when I was at Wellington. But of course, U.S. is is, is my bread and butter. So there's a lot more destruction ahead, and uh, you know, cash is king. And I you know I just hope it helps enough that the average person doesn't get sucked into trying to buy a low of some kind. We're just not there yet. Yeah. So so guy, just I'm reminded of. Uh... The line from Richard Russell was discussed in the room the other day that in a bull market, the hardest thing to do is to stay fully invested, whereas in a bear market, the hardest thing is to just, just stay out. So <laughs> you, you basically want to be in cash. Like, is there anything you'd be buying right now? Uh, if You know what I might try to do, George? Maybe we'll talk about later. I could send out a piece that I did on Tuesday in the rankings of the 11 S&P sectors. They've been pretty consistent. So energy has been my... My favorite area, going back a couple of, well, since November uh, 2000, I believe it is. That's the one place where the relative absolute trends are, you know, pretty firm and stable, especially the relative. Uh, so I would gravitate to that area. Um, that that real that that that's what jumps out the most to me. Oh, and the other thing, George, I want to mention. So I did a lot of work years back about, you know, studying the the run up in the late 20s into the 32 low. And I, I mentioned this before, one of the spaces. You know, after the 29 peak, the lows. A lot of these stocks came in, you know, 1932. So basically, they round tripped everything, and you're seeing the same thing now. So you know, just look at weekly, monthly charts of things such as PayPal. It's all the way back where the basically where the parabola started. So it goes back to what I learned years ago. Someone told me you know, the, the market is a one act play. It's the same storylines, just different actors. So we're seeing it unfold in front of our eyes. I mean, Square is another stock that's doing the same mo. DocuSign the same mo. Everything is all the stuff is being round tripped. So, yeah, just be careful. That's all I, I can say. Yeah, one, one last question before we go to Michael Belkin. Yeah. Um, look, what the market's going to do? Who the heck knows? Yeah, We're right, right. Trying, trying to help each other here. And so, I, I think you know what I really love about all you guys in this room, this community. It's one thing if you have one guy going out on a limb making a half-ass crazy prediction, but when you've got uniformity of opinion amongst smart guys and i don't want to hear any wise guys oh, 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 it's not bullshit this is like a distinct minority but when the smartest guys i know and i just want to cry i'm looking at this i'm looking at the phone right now i see a greer falcon you 
Mark Newman, Lapola, Jeff Hirsch. I mean, these are the smartest three aces. I'm just going down the first three or four rows. This is like, this is insane. And so, you know, when I'm, when I'm hearing the same thing from the smartest guys I know, there's information content in that. And so one question I want to ask you, Guy. Sure. Not so much in terms of price and level, but I want to talk about time. Uh, and, not even, and not even so much how fast it's going to go down. Um, I hope this doesn't go down that quickly because, you know, you want to keep on having the gift that keeps on giving. But in terms of whenever this thing bottoms, wherever it bottoms, like how long do you think it's going to take to reach a bottom? Is it a month? Is it a year? And then importantly, looking at market structure, forgetting about, forgetting about you know, what you think the economy is going to do, all this stuff, but just pattern recognition, you know, great Walter Stone who inspired both of us. When you just look at patterns, what, you know, in, in, in Michael Belkin, you're warming up in the bullpen, so we're going to have you weigh in probably in your Japanese experience. But <laughs> my experience, but I'm not, I don't follow the charts as closely as you guys, that it's going to take a long, long time. Yeah. The repair takes years. So, so I think what's, so as someone said the, in the room the other day, what really kills people is time, not price. So yeah, we do. Drives we people do. Down. So, so, so yeah. guy, could you speak to us about time in terms of, how long do you think the decline could take? And then once we get to the bottom, whatever it is, are we looking like it years in the desert? Yeah, I, I, uh, great, great, great question. I think, you know, we could probably see a low later this year. But, you know, that's, that's price destruction. The one thing you know, you're not talking about is mental destruction. Because what happens in these cycles is that you could lose, I don't want to say, I don't want to use the word generation of an investor, but you're going to lose investors that are, are going to lose confidence in, you know, starting to put money to work again. Oh, I got burned here, burned there. What am I going to trust? So, it's the, you know, the thing is, psych- psychologically, people are going to take more time probably to get involved in the market. So I think this is, you know, once we get a low sometime later, maybe later this year, you're going to have a reflex rally up. Just as we did after, after the 32 low, you rallied up to 37, came back down a few years later. You know, I'm not saying that we're having the same thing now, but you'll have to have a period of a rally a test of some kind, and that could take, it could take more than a year before you get a sustainable advance, you know, from there. So, so that, you know, I think mentally that's a big, that's going to be a big thing to, for people to overcome going forward. I mean, good guy. That's that you hit the nail on that more than a year. I mean, look, Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I, mean I mean, guy, how many days like this could people deal, deal with? You're telling me yeah. we're not going to have a bottom until maybe later this year. Can you imagine the metal, the, yeah. the metal capital is going to get destroyed? Unbelievable. But, you know, but you know what's scary, George? Remember, I talked about this in the last, one of the last spaces that you know Walter t- taught me this from day one back when I was in college working for him. He said, uh, you know, people didn't lose most of their money in 1929, October, that crash. It was in the subsequent couple of years where they were buying the bear market lows for a rally. Those rallies were 20, 30, 40 percent in, in magnitude. You know, it, it, that sucked in money. And then then it rolled over and they got clocked again into the 32 low. You were down 90 percent from the high. And, and, so, and, and, and guy, let me interrupt you. But yeah, Walter, God rest his soul. I mean, he was can, you, can I remember? I can't remember exactly how old he was. Not only was he alive when in 1929, but was he trading the markets in 29, actually? Um, because uh, Walter, because. I mean, that's one of the great things about this room. I mean, all of us were trained by the greats. We studied under the greats. And just out of curiosity, I mean, Walter's passed, but when, when was Walter born? Was he, was he old enough to be trading the markets? He, he was involved in the 60s. No, he wasn't that. But he studied all the stuff by hand. And then I did charts for him uh, by hand. We did everything by hand way back in the 80s. And, man, that stuff, you, you memorize the patterns and the charts in your chart book uh, over time. But, he, no, no, he did it uh, – all by hand and start in the 60s. That's awesome. All right, you yeah. guys. So, so guys, j- just hang there. I'm sure we'll have some questions. Yep. So I might have got... to run in 20 minutes, but just to give oh, you All right, up. fine. Okay, fine. Okay. That's cool. That's I'm, cool. I'm, I'll be around. All yeah. right, so just hang there. And now, Mr. Belkin, um, we got to stop meeting like this. I think between the space you had a week ago Monday, and then we're in the, in the, in the big room on Thursday night with Tony and Guy and everybody else. This is the third time in nine days. What a pleasure, Michael. Um, good to see you. What's going on? What's top of mind for you, Michael? You, you've been so spot on. So, um, Michael, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, how's the, how's the uh, audio for me? Good. 100%, okay. 100%. We're good. Okay, great. So, um, let me just review what I do to set the stage for what I want to say. So, I, I have a forward-looking model. It's a form of time series analysis. gives a 12-period forward forecast. And it looks for turning points and things. So most of the time, the market likes to buy low and sell high. 
Um, other times it will buy high on upside breakout or sell low on a downside breakdown. But anyways, that's what I do. So I'm looking for changes. It's not a broken clock. Uh, the model's not a broken clock. It looks for things that are changing. And um, I bring that up because a lot of things just changed for me this week in the Belkin report. So let me, and it goes against a little bit about uh, what Tony and Guy just no, said. No, 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 <laughs> you, you didn't, Michael, Michael, say it ain't not, so. Michael, you didn't turn bullish, did you? <laughs> no, 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 no. But here's what, here's, it's more of the, um, well, first of all, let's talk about what's happened in the market this week. The NASDAQ's down 6%. The S&P is down 5% so far this week. It's Wednesday. The VIX volatility index is up 8%. And the TLT, da 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 T-bond future is up 4%. I'd like to zero in on that one. So I, I went long bonds this week, long TLT and long euro dollars, long two-year, five-year, 10-year notes. And um, this is, uh, well, that's from, uh, strictly off the model. Um, but let's just talk about that for a second. The TLT is up 4%. The S&P is down 5%. That's 9% if you're long bonds and short stocks. And um, so that's the, another position I added this week. I said long TLT, short S SPY. Um, so why is that so important? Uh, well, I, I, let me put it this way. I learned that one the hard way in the 1987 crash. You know, I, I went into Solomon Brothers in 1986. In 1987, I was sitting there all summer long watching the bonds trade off. If you weren't there or if you... Do you will remember a Greenspan came in, he was appointed new Fed chairman, started raising interest rates. He raised interest rates, the bonds sold off. Of course, interest rates were at a much higher level then. But um, the bond, 30 year bond future sold off by 24% between March and it bottomed on October 19th, okay, the day of the crash. And the, um, the market went lower, the stock market went lower after that, but bonds went up sharply for a long time. So I've been looking for this, waiting for it to set up in the model forecast, and now it's there. So uh, long story short, I think we have a 87 crashy kind of um, scenario here where asset allocators um, shift out of stocks into bonds because bonds have sold off too much or they've sold off enough so that relative value models um, uh, basically say buy bonds. Now, Put that, let me put that in perspective. Basically, the Fed has raised rates by what? 75 basis points, 125 basis point increase, and 150 basis point increases. And they've talked the market. They, with Fed speak, they've shifted like the two-year up enormously, up 200, you know, the short, so that much more than what they've done is what they've said and what markets have adjusted to in the forward markets and also in, you know, two-year yield, five-year yield, things like that. Green, um, Powell actually bragged about that when somebody at the press conference last week, somebody asked him, do you think the Fed's lost credibility? That was like the best question I've ever heard at one of those. And he kind of, his mouth, you look at him, he looks like the cat in the hat with his mouth, corners of his mouth turned down. It's kind of ridiculous. But um, anyways, he said, oh no, look at the forward rates. The market has adjusted. So there was a little secret there about what the Fed is like blabber mouthing to trying to move markets with speaking. And they've done it. And um, what I would like to say is, I think they've overshot. So all these, um, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, there's inflation, but let me talk about that in a second. But um, I think everything is peaking. So just to give you an idea, I think commodities are, have peaked, okay? Big change for me. I closed all my long commodity positions in the Belkin Report this week. That includes energy, grains, and precious metals. I went short base metals a, a couple weeks ago. I closed, so things like copper, aluminum. Um, this week, I added grains and shorts, things like coffee and cocoa, and not wheat yet, but corn and soybeans, new shorts. I closed all energy and metals industry group stock outperform recommendations. Um, so sorry, that's a little contrary to what the, uh, the previous guys were saying, but um, I'm looking forward in the model forecast. And, you know, the the XLE is up like 40, 45% on the year or something. The S&P is down 10 or 15%. So the, the, there's huge, like there's 50%, um, something like 40, 50% alpha in energy stocks. To me, I'm taking it off the table. It's over. And I'm added long government bonds, 
and long euro dollar futures. Whoa, that's a weird contrarian one. Okay, so I think the forward um, euro dollar future curve has overshot. And so I'm recommending, uh, I just had a conference call with a client this morning, recommending euro dollar calls. Okay, so right around 97-ish, March 2023, it's 96, 70-something. Um, so could easily, I'm, I'm not saying, uh, you know, uh, I just think that interest rates, basically, the, the markets are transitioning from inflationary fears into a recession scenario. So um, today's inflation report, 8.2% annualized after 8.5% previous month. My model forecast points down for the rate of change and uh, also the level of the CPI, not quite yet. So maybe two, it's two to three months out. That might have been the peak last month, um, May. This was April's report today. Um, so I see inflation rolling over. All these commodities are kind of over-owned. And so what do you do if you're in the market? Um, you know, energy has been a good play, and I've recommended it on these um, last – until now, I've been, it's been a favorite long for me. Not anymore. So what do you do? The only things that I have in the model for outperforming the index are total chicken longs. XLP, that's staples, consumer staples. XLU, that's utilities. And XLV, that's healthcare. Pretty much in that order. Staples, utilities, healthcare. Um, and just to give you an idea what happened today, uh, XLU utilities was up 1%, 0.5%, 7.5% on the day, with the S&P down 1.5%, right? So we had... Two to three percent positive alpha in utilities today. Staples were down a little bit, but they outperformed the index. So basically, that fits with the buy bonds, sell stocks. Everything's gone utterly defensive. I looked at um, corporate earnings uh, just before I got on. Um, S and P operating earnings, eighty-five percent reported according to Standard and Poor's, are down eleven percent quarter to quarter. Reported earnings are down 14% quarter to quarter. The annual numbers, it's going to take them a little while to roll over, but I have forward forecast for S&P earnings down, approaching. It's already there quarterly. It will be there in the second quarter, which is now. We're in the middle of the second quarter. They're reporting the first quarter, which is 85% reported. So corporate earnings down, commodities peaking. Um, basically, I think, what to put it in a nutshell, the, they created $9.5 trillion of stimulus, $5 trillion of uh, fiscal stimulus, $4.5 trillion of Fed balance sheet expansion. That's over, right? No more stimulus, no more funny money, no more government, um, you know, no more free checks to put into your Robinhood account, et cetera, et cetera. And the Fed is, is uh, pledged to start doing quantitative tightening. We'll see about that. But basically, I think it's not we're not going straight down, but I think everything's peaking. So everything that's worked in terms of commodities, uh, et cetera, and and being short bonds, basically, by the way, there's a million something short euro dollar futures, a large spec between large spec and short spec. There is a huge short euro dollar uh, uh, speculative futures position, um, biggest ever, as, as far as I can see. And um, so I think there's a potential. I, I think, again, I just think everything's overshot. So the forward rates that the Fed talked up made the euro dollar futures forward go down. I think there could be a big rebound. So basically, it's a huge, huge risk off scenario. A little bit like 1987. Nothing's ever exactly the same, but resembles it, you know, rhymes. Um, so what do you do? Uh, I think the market keeps going down. We're accelerating to the downside. You asked, like, how far could this go? I think right now we are accelerating. Um, so today, for instance, there were 1,463 new NASDAQ lows, 1,463, 16 new highs. That's one six new highs and one four six three, 1,463 new lows. Put that in perspective. Uh, in the in the virus coronavirus sell off March uh, 2020, uh, the peak in the new Nasdaq lows was 2097. 
So we're kind of getting there. We're about two thirds, three quarters of the way there. By the way, that 2097 number was the highest I have on record for new NASDAQ lows going back to 1993. I just took a quick look before I came on. So anyways, uh, long story short, we're accelerating to the downside. Tech remains my favorite short. These tech stocks have no bottom in sight. You know, I mean, they keep, I don't want to get cocky. You know, I've learned the hard way. Don't get cocky. That's when a uh, bulldozer comes out of left field. So what do you do? Stay short. Things like, ex like for instance, today, tech sector was down 3% with utilities up 1%. There's a huge rotation. So if you want to be market neutral, by the way, I run a alpha capture. One of my clients is an alpha capture fund, and I'm, I'm up 7% um, in that, totally market neutral this quarter after being up 28% last quarter. So, um, and I just do what's in the report. You know, I just put on the longs. I have longs and shorts, totally market neutral. So I'm long utilities, staples, things like that. I'm short, NVIDIA, Apple, uh, Tesla, things like that. I think Tesla is a great short. Um, so we're accelerating to the downside. Tech is leading. Arc was down 10% today. It's kind of, it's down, you know, I'm not saying Arc is a great short at this level, but, you know, it just keeps kind of doing the baton death march, boom, 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 boom down into oblivion. Um, I think it's going lower, but we're definitely accelerating into the downside. So what I would do is, it sounds crazy to be recommend long bonds, but that's what I'm doing, long TLT, uh, particularly in a short, long TLT, short stock thing, which is up 9% so far this week after I added it. Long TLT, short SPY. Want to be market neutral? There's a nice little spread for you. Another one, XLU, sh long XLU utilities, short SPY. Market neutral. You know, you know, don't expect huge momentum gains, but nice sleep at night trade. You probably make money in that. Same thing with... Um, Staples, XLP, long XLP, short SPY. So those are the kind of spreads that are working. Uh, volatility, I think they've artificially held it down. I'm amazed um, it's not up more. It's only at VIX is up 8% on the week. I think we're, so my forecast for realized volatility, that's a 20-day standard deviation, things like for the S&P and NASDAQ. By the way, NASDAQ, 20-day uh, standard deviation is 40-something percent. It was 40% before today. That's, uh, th that means there's 90 95% probability the NASDAQ could be up or down 40% in the next year. Um, and that is high. So the, a more normal level for that is more like 20, below 20%, as, can be as low as 10%. So we're in this environment where you get, it's, it's Mr. Toad's wild ride, you know, if you've ever been to Disneyland where you go straight towards the wall and then it turns. So we're getting major swings in the market. Um, the, the characteristics of that are a daily bigger daily percentage changes, both up and down. So in a, in a down market, you know, the biggest up days were in, in market history percentage were in 1929 to 1932. So don't be surprised if you get big up days, but you sell them. Like Guy said, I think I absolutely agree with him. He said one to, one to three day move uh, rallies, that's totally normal in a pair market. But right now, I don't know. I think we're accelerating to the downside. I would remain short. Uh, the only thing I would buy is bonds. I'd be careful of commodities. I closed out all my commodities, um, energy, everything. You, uh, natural gas, you know, is still strong, but um, I just think, you know, it's most of the way there. Uh, I'll stand aside for now. And uh, just look out, you know, don't get hurt by the market decline and try to take advantage of it uh, with some of these um, defensive positions. That's fantastic, Michael. One question for you. Um... The, the the relative the XLU XLP XLV all that stuff, um, I, I get it. Those are huge uh, performance can, performance candidates, but on an absolute basis, this is why we don't really help people in the room. And you may say that you know in a world where flat is the new up, those stocks may just go sideways or everything else collapses and the spread works. If you actually think that there's not much absolute upside in those stocks, and I'm, I'm framing the question, you know, it'd be a mistake for someone to go out and buy, you know buy Clark. So Belkin said it's an outperformer. So my question to you is in absolute terms, in absolute terms, not relative, in absolute terms, are those three outperformer sectors that you mentioned, those three ETFs, XLU, XLP, XLV, in absolute terms, do you think those things are going to go up or they're just going to go down less than everything else? Um, yeah, the, the absolute forecast is not up for those, okay? They might have some positive gains a little bit. But like I think you said, go sideways as the market goes down. That's the best you can expect from within from sectors within the market. That's what my model's picking up. And by the way, that that reinforces my downward uh, forecast. My my 
for the market. My long so the Belkin report on page six has a long it has long stock recommendations and short stock recommendations. My long stock recommendations on the left column are down to the shortest I can remember, and it's all like this total chicken long stuff, and it's all a it's all fall less than the market. The one thing that does have an upward absolute forecast is bonds. And I probably most people won't, don't want to hear that. It's total contrarian, but they could bounce big time. So like I said, so TLT is up 4% on the week. I think it bottomed on Monday. That may have been the bottom in the, in the bond bear market for now. Anyways, this could be a, you know, this could be a, just a bear market bounce, but I think this is significant. So if there's one thing in absolute terms that could go up TLT, other than that, everything else, just relative. That's great. Thank you, Michael. One last question before we go to Jeff Hirsch. Uh, Michael, um, you took down all your commodity longs. Uh, did you also take down your gold longs? Yes, and my uh, <laughs> I also do the gold report. I have a gold stock report, and I, I basically said it went out last night, and the pain in my uh, liver today is from people sticking needles in my Belkin voodoo dolls because, um, yeah, so – Gold stocks, it's over for me. I took, I removed, um, I've had gold stocks. They had a nice rally. They rolled over a couple, three, four weeks ago. And they should have come back. They didn't. And um, for now, I think everything goes down together. So GDX out as a long, GLD out as a long, that's physical gold. SLV out as a long, that's physical silver. So um, sadly, uh, for gold bugs, I don't think it's going to work. In this particular decline, Con, you know, it, it was the same in February, March, 2020. Um, the everything went down together. Uh, so I think we're in a in a situation. So gold doesn't it does not have gold GDX does not have an outperform versus the index anymore, and I think it's vulnerable. Um, so that's uh, sadly, you know, as that's, that's great. Uh, okay. All right. So just hold on for one second here. So Mark Spiegel was is the uh, featured speaker today. I want to work in just a couple more guys, and then we'll go to, to Mark. I know Mark has some questions uh, for you, Michael Belk, and he, he back channel messaged me. So um, I want to go to um, Jeff Hirsch, Mark Newman, and uh, Tom Thornton. Uh, in respect of uh, Mark Spiegel's time, if you guys keep it tight and short, uh, you can get up on your soapbox uh, later, but um, I told Mark he could come on at 5 o'clock, 35.15. So I know you guys, you've been up there waiting to speak. So let's go to uh, let's go to Jeff Hirsch, Mark Newman, and Tom Thornton. Jeff, how, how you doing, man? What's up? Hey, George, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we're good. We're good. I'm all about short. Brevity is the soul of it, you know. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to bring a little, uh, you know, seasonal and, and four-year cycle perspective here. I know you saw that chart I put up there uh, at the CMT symposium comparing um, current 22 action to 60 and 70. Um, we've taken 60 off that comparison and added 62 and 74. And those are the, I know there was, uh, what <clears throat> Mr. Belkin was talking about 87, I think it was. Um, we're looking at those midterm years and the chart, you know, rhyming situation, as well as being in that weak spot of the four-year cycle, Q2, Q3 of, of uh, the midterm year, which is also to sell in May, worst six months period. Um, and we're looking at a lot of negatives too. I, I just thought I'd, I'd reinforce those sectors that were mentioned, the XLP, XLU, XLV. Those are our, our top sectors for the worst months. Um, you know, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so Jeff, you, I think it'd be very helpful. Sorry to interrupt you, but please, I think for the audience, it'd be very helpful. So I'm going to put the words, I'm going to stuff the words into your mouth. You can just say yes or no. But one of the things that struck me from your great presentation um, at the CMT conference, uh, and by the way, for those of you who don't know him, um, Jeff runs Stock Traders Almanac, a publication you're probably all familiar with. Uh, you can follow him. He's at, at Almanac Trader. Um, it's, a, it's a great product. But so you put those charts up and it reminded me of sometimes simple is the best. And I was reminded of the sell and man go away and, and, and also what happens in the second year of the president or wherever we are, the second year of the yep. presidential cycle. Could you just review for people those two particulars, this, where we are in the presidential cycle and what the contour of, the, of this year usually looks like? And then even more spectacularly, the whole sell and go away, like it just blows my mind. You know, if you just you could sell well, the market on May 1st everywhere and go on vacation and come back in November, you wouldn't miss anything. So <laughs> could, you just, could you just review the, those two observations, please? We're not the go away people. We're the reposition people. That's that's the little oh, buzzword oh, that they say. The king of re 
the euphemism for oh, go for it. Go on. But we have to jump on it. I mean, we we overlay MACD with the best and worst six months. So the best months are November to April. Dow's averages seven and a half percent over those those six months. Worst six months, uh, May to October, it's 0.8 percent, 0.8. So market kind of goes sideways. A lot more volatility, and it's especially um, exacerbated in the midterm election year when you've got a uh, an incumbent president, you know, sort of running for their approval ratings, which is what we're seeing very prototypically here, which is what happens. Uh, and that's why the four-year cycle exists. So we overlay MACD. We had our MACD sell signal on April 7th for the Dow and S&P. And uh, we did move into some bonds as well. TLT, AGG, BND are the ones that we go into for the, the worst months. Um, and in addition to you know, to the to the seasonals. I mean, we've got the fundamental and geopolitical and monetary, you know, backdrop. But um, technically, which is, you know, we, we met at the, the technical conference, the CMT, some of these levels that we've been looking at, um, you know, are, are breaking and it's bringing in uh, 2020 levels and pre-pandemic levels. You look at your Fibonacci numbers, it's depending upon whether you're looking at the NDX, the, the regular NASDAQ composite or the Dow or the S&P or whatever. Um you know, there was a sign we had up in the office years ago. It's like about about picking downside targets. Don't do it. You know, um, as Helene had pointed out in her great chart from from Justin Mammoth, the sentiment cycle where we were at at that just ahead of the panic level. And she, if I remember correctly, said that she was looking for a low in the next one to three months. Um, I, I, I'm not trying to get bullish on it, but, you know, this weak spot of the four year cycle sets up that sweet spot from Q4 midterm year to um Q2 pre-election year, where you see gains of like 20 and, and 30 percent in the Dow and S&P is about 20, Nasdaq's about um, 30 percent. So, you know, cash is king here. Be patient and wait for that, you know, prototypical midterm bottom. And as my father, you know, wrote years ago, midterm years are a bottom picker's paradise. And, and it's really panning out there and, and have a look at some of those other midterm years that look like it. So I don't want to Hog up, Tom. I want, yeah, I want Jim, uh, you to get Kevin, to Mark. I really appreciate that. Stay on stage. I'm sure you have some questions. We're countdown to Mark Spiegel. I want to do Newman and then uh, Tom Thornton. Please keep it tight, guys. Newman, like, like, like yours truly, you talk a lot like me. So try to keep it tight. There'll be plenty of time, I'm sure. We're going to have a, a total food fight open up when, when, when Spiegel gets on stage. So, Mark, you got one or two comments you want to drop here in sequence. Um, yeah. It, it's good, good to see you, man. What's up? Hey, good seeing you. Um, so a couple things on just sentiment right here. Uh, uh, Mr. Belkin mentioned the volatility uh, sort of, I would call it a somewhat underperformance based on uh, uh, this week's action so far. I had a combo today with a vol guy, and basically he said that he thought 70% of the degrossing had occurred, which means people had their puts on or they got the catch in. And then I pushed back. I said, but I think that's only, that's less than 50% of the people who actually believe in the downside. And he actually said he thought it was closer to 30%. In other words, right, no one really believes how, how much further it can go here. And I think that's super interesting conjunction with what Belkin was saying just before, right? He's seeing the acceleration. And I think like George, we've talked recently, when you deliver a, 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 a so the, the, the vol market, the VIX should have been up more this week and today so far relative to what's going on and the credit market starting to crack a little. So I think it's super interesting. We're at that point and we're also at the point with a lot of technical numbers, Tesla 700, Bitcoin 28, 800, and the vol is not moving as much. So it's a super interesting juncture here where what Belkin said, which by the way, he said it two, three weeks ago and he said it four weeks ago, six weeks ago, beginning of April that, that, that in, in, in May, or at least in the last session, he said in May, he expected some major, and now he's just sort of confirmed that when you see the people going to the bonds, that's the beginning of this turn. And the fact that I see it in vault land where guys are sort of believing in there could be some downside, but a lot of the guys don't want to believe it and are still clinging to longs, as I think Guy said earlier, it is setting up for a real interesting you know, spot right here. Um, yeah, yeah Mark, 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 let me interrupt for one second. You made a really interesting point about Guy's kind of bearish, but not, you know, really super bearish. And I remember years ago, I can't remember, was Ken Hebner going off on, Mark, please mute yourself, um, if it was uh, 
Ken Hebrew, whoever it was, somebody, I think we were talking about energy stocks. I can't remember what it was. It doesn't really matter. And, you know, that group was going up and the lazy trade was just to buy it because it's going up related to put in Japanese broker speak. And the tourists were all in that sector. And let's just say it was energy. I can't even remember what it was. And yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Ken Hebrew. What? It doesn't matter. And the guy I was talking to said, no, 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 no. The really contrarian move here, uh, position right here, is to be uber bullish, not just bullish. In other words, the people that liked the energy stocks to say it was energy, they didn't really fully appreciate or understand what was really going on. And if they did, they would be even more jacked up on, on energy. Let's just say it was energy than they were. And so you have this sort of superficial, complacent, flow with the go type of mentality and you have the lazy longs of tourists, and they're, it's, they're, they're not hardcore believers. They're just tourists. And so they're not convicted with the position, the size that they might be if they really got the joke. And so I'm really struck by your comments that it, people, and Michael Belk, and this is a compliment to you, okay, or Guy Serendulo, it's only like people like yours truly or sickos, financial perverts like Guy and Belkin who – you know, it, it, like if you really say what you think, the men in the white coats will come and, you know, come for you or the guys in the, in the black limos or if we're talking about the electric car company, it shall not be named. And, and, and the guy were to buy Twitter, like maybe he'll come and shut you down. So, like, you don't say these pol these things in polite company because you're going to scare the women and children. But I'm just struck by what you're saying. You know, I think there's a chance. There's a chance. I use the word crash for the first time on the weekend. For months, I've been saying equities represent return for your risk. But I, you and I spoke about this morning, Mark. We had a long conversation. I used the word crash for the first time this weekend because the tectonic plates are like pressing up against each other. And as Helene Weissler always says, you know, sentiment follows price. And it's like the example I gave you this morning. You know, if you're, you're walking out across the pond in the middle of the winter and the ice is thick, no problem. But you go out in a warm March day when the sun is beating down on the ice, like you might just fall through. And it kind of feels to me like that's what we're approaching from a sentiment and positioning perspective, which ties up with a lot of, you know, the time series analysis Michael Belkin does and sort of your gut feel. So I, I don't know. I think you're on to something, Mark. And listen, I'm not going to ask you who's going to crash, who's going to crash. I'm not asking that. You know, whether the market crashes or it just goes down in a desultory fashion, you know, 2 3% a day here, a day there, and three months from now, we're 20% lower. You're going to get to the same place. And I kind of wonder, and John Roke, he's not here, but he said this to me a few years ago, and he was talking about given the different, the way the character, the nature of the market's changed, it's machines, it's algos, it's VWAPs. That's the world you live in, Spiegel. All right, you can speak to this. There's going to be a question here, not just a rant. It's not like back in the day where, you know, George Soros says, oh, 20 billion, I want out, hit the bid. There's Steve Cohen or Julian Robertson. And you have individuals getting emotional, just slamming things, and and, and they're and they're looking at the this price discovery. They know what they own. Fundamentals may turn down, so you blow it out. This there is no price discovery. It's all just sort of you know momentum, lazy momentum of following. People don't know what they own, and everything's VWAPed. And again, computers and algos don't get emotional, and so. The sort of headline grabbing, I remember, you know, 1987, like it was yesterday, where the Dow fell, you know, 500 odd points, 2,700, 2,200, you know, back in the day when 500 points was a lot. You don't going to get those days, or you, maybe you will, but, but the trick is the public only wakes up when they see the headline of like the mega crash on one day. Otherwise, it's like, you know, they don't look at their statement, blah, blah, blah. Well, now they're starting to get the joke because the soundbite indices in the first, for the, for the first time in the last few weeks, this year have started to give up the ghost. Whereas last year, year we've talked about a lot in this room. The internal bear market really started in February of last year, so the average stock is down some ungodly number, 35, 40 percent, whatever. I can't keep up with it. It's, it's going down at such a frenetic pace. So, Mark, can you speak to? And I'm getting off my soapbox. I want to hear from you. Just the way the business is done, the way you do your business, the way people trade, the fact that that active management is such a smaller part of the game now. It's all this passive nonsense, like. You you said it yourself. You know, history rhymes; it doesn't repeat itself. How does it make you think about how the contour of this decline might be a little bit different, Mark? 
Mark Spiegel, Mark Newman, you there? Hey, I'm here, George. Yep. So, so you, you I wanted ahead. to reflect on what, on what, you know, the way it's done now, I look, a lot less phone communication as it is, right? But when I do get guys on the phone, it's, it's you know, it's obviously, you know, super interesting. But what I do know recently, and again, this speaks to where we are, there are a couple guys who, because you give them a bearish sort of reality check and say, look, here's a glide path, you could, uh, you know, you... They sort of don't want to talk to you because you have no friends if you're right as a bear a lot of the time. So it turns out that guys are sort of digging their heels in against the sort of reality check of technical and, and, and market internal behavior. And I, I find that you can get a good read from people by how, you know, how tightly wound they are in terms of that communication, especially in these kinds of markets. Right. Like if you mentioned, like I just, just, I think it was yesterday or the day before, I mentioned a slight bullish posture to the bonds. Again, Belkin said, look for the reversal. I looked for that reversal. I saw it earlier in the week. I was like, stocks down, bonds going up. And I made that call to people and everybody sold, 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 sold into my buy bonds ID on TLT. So I couldn't get that if I was, um, you know, the interaction in that kind of sense, you hear someone say, that's the worst idea I ever heard. You, you know, you don't see that. You don't get that over the um, over like IB chat or whatever. So that's how to me, you know, getting guys on the phone and really hearing it in their voice is how I sense sort of are they just talking the talk or are they really positioned how they say. And I think it's important because it goes to the whole sentiment thing and it goes to am I I'm st- I'm, I'm I'm bearish here. I'm only 50 percent long. That doesn't make sense to me. But I hear that a lot. It's like. You know, guys are mixed up in their positions and what they feel like. And I think that, um, you know, you have to really get get people on the phone and pinch them a little bit to make sure that you can hear in their voice sort of what they're talking. Um, I think that's really important these days in the business. And it's helped me to be able to sort of sense, and as I'm talking here, there's still like guys work, like Michael's work, not enough people, even the big guys. I, the other day I said, Here's a teeny little put for the uh, next two days in case in case markets get shitty. And the, I, I, at, at later in the day, I, I said, I'm pounding the table through the IB chat. And one guy who's I've known forever said, dude, then go buy him yourself. And it was like that guy didn't want to hear that there's a chance we go out on the balls of our ass, which we did. Right. So, like, guys don't even want to. All right, Mark, 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 and Mark. That's it. That's Mark, it. That's Mark, it. That's Mark, how no, hold on. Hold on. Mark, Mark, Mark. I'm going to ask you to cut it because. We, I'm, I'm, I'm really I'm sorry. Cut. We you can come back later. And Tommy, I'm going to ask you to hold it because we kind of had a we, had, we cut, no 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 no. It's, it, we want to hear what you got to say. It's just it's just we made Mark Spiegel let, uh, wait for too long. So uh, Mark, um, I've known Mark for a million years, um, going back to when we were kids in Princeton, New Jersey. We reconnected uh, in recent years. Uh, Mark is one of the most knowledgeable guys in the street on Tesla and is fighting the good fight and trying to speak truth and justice to markets generally. And he's got a lot of opinions about a lot of things. Most of it will be Tesla and, and, and the biggest and the title of the room, the biggest bubble of ever. So, Mark, sorry for the delay, but um, the floor is yours. We're all waiting to hear what you got to say. Um, you know, is, is Elon Musk finally getting his comeuppance, Mark? Please unmute yourself. Before, before we talk before we talk Tesla, which everybody's probably sick of hearing about and – you know, I don't know what I could add it at this point, but I, I would like to. Uh, um, Mike Belkin, are you still on? Yes. Hi, I'm this here. is Mark. Hi. Um, hey. I, I, I thought what some of the stuff you said was interesting. And if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to probe you a little bit on it. And uh, particularly about the bonds and commodities. And, you know, to be clear, other than owning gold, I'm not talking my book here at all or countering you or whatever. I have no bond or commodity positions. But, um, a couple of questions, if you, if you don't mind. First of all, you know, crude oil is 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 one hundred and five, and and Brent is is one hundred and seven, and China is basically like half shut down, right? So, how can you be sure? And same thing for, I guess, base metals. How can you be that confident about commodities uh, rolling over when the biggest driver of demand isn't there, but will inevitably be back? pretty soon i guess that's my first question okay sure uh good point um so i I i'm two things i i everything that i do is based on a forecast okay and i just learned 
the model is smarter than my hunches. And I try to make my hunches and my fundamental views um, based on what the model says. And all I can tell you is intermediate term for, uh, like look at um, DBB, that's uh, the base metals ETF, D dog, boy, boy, DBB. It's rolled over big time about three, four, five weeks ago. It's, that's a major short to me. Um, I do have that worry in the back of my mind, like China comes back, they start buying oil again, base metals. Um, but uh, I don't see any sign of that. I see lo lockdowns continuing. I see factories closed, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you do have a point, and that is a risk. But um, I, well, I, all I can say, I'm, I'm a total contrarian. Do you know anybody that's short? Like his short commodities, I got to be like the only person in the universe. Well, <laughs> I'm not. So I'm not. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at the DBB chart, and you know, basically, I'm looking at the weekly. Basically, it fell off the cliff when China shut down, and right. you know, so I don't know what your time frame is or was on the, on this trade, but I mean, at some point, probably in the next few weeks, China's going to say, "Fuck it, we got to reopen," and you know, they'll start vaccinating people. They'll do what they have to do. And so I'm just wondering, so, so you you did that just because the chart broke down without thinking about, and I, I'm not being critical here, please, just without thinking about why the chart broke down. I, that's sort of what I'm hearing from you here. Okay, so b back to my original, the first thing I said in, in when I started speaking was, I, everything's based on time series analysis, direction, position, intensity. And um, the model is it's not perfect like i wouldn't it's not like 99.999% where you want to l land a, a a space shuttle or a booster rocket you know back on the f floating platform in the water it's not that good it's pretty darn good though and it's better than anything i I've, I've been over the forecasting territory exhaustively you know i was in the stat department business school at uc berkeley prop trading at solomon brothers and this is the model i developed and everything i, I do is based on it but um i would say that um to counter your question, I would say what's happening in China is symptomatic of what's happening to the world. So we had all this stimulus, the stimulus is over, we had the huge ramp and everything, and now China, it, I mean, do you think China, I don't think China's going to bounce back like, you know, going straight back up uh, right away or anything like that. I think the world, everything in the world is turning down. So not only are the markets turning down, but we are headed into an, a global economic downturn. That's what my economic uh, stuff is, is saying. So all these things, I mean, that's the way commodities look at the top of a cycle. Everybody's long. You know, every, it, they start going down. People complain if you're short. So um, I, I think we're at a, just to basically peak everything. That's what I'm seeing in the model forecast. If I, if I could just interject, uh, Mark Spiegel. Before Bell, uh, I, I would just say, as I try to be Switzerland and referee the thing, I know you're not attacking Michael. Um, Michael, I think, is a technician. He's or is a chartist or strategist. He's focusing on the what as opposed to the why. I mean, we can always, you know, put our own narrative or whatever the price looks like, but and we can theorize why it's happening. But I think if I just reflect on your question, uh, Mark, which is a great one, and it was top of mind for me as well, I think the question is very well put. But I think it's the old sort of, you know, trade what you see versus what you think. And, and Michael happens to use time series analysis to project forward as opposed to, and you and I have done this before, we have our theory that, you know, this is a piece of crap, that's going to go down, this is going to go down, and the chart's not confirming it. So I, I just think that the bid ass spread here is the what versus the why. I hope that, I hope that helps. Yeah, okay, look, I mean, I can see... I can see looking at this chart why for sure you would have shorted. I mean, I'm using DBB as a proxy, you know, three weeks ago, you know, you had a red candle and then it, you know, then, then it broke down. And like, if that happened out of the blue and everything was humming along, I'd be like, holy shit, this is telling us something. So I guess the only point I'm making as a counter to your model is this is, this is an exogenous event. And, and I think it may be distorting what you're seeing in that chart, but, but I could be wrong. But so here's here's my follow up question, because you're talking about buying bonds. Um, where do you think, you know, in th the rate of inflation ultimately winds up? And by ultimately, let's say, I don't know, a, a year and a half from now, I'm, I'm picking a number. And, and the reason and let me just give you let me just a little bit of background. Before the whole COVID thing happened, before all the stimulus happened, when the Fed was not QEing, 
core CPI was running around 2.2%. And so, and that was before, you know, we had a war on fossil fuels because, because Trump was in office. Um, we had, um, 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 we, we, that was before we were trying to onshore all our supply chains, which makes everything a lot more expensive, obviously, than making stuff in China. So when you factor that in, where do you think inflation ultimately winds up? And, and you know, I'm not saying that it hasn't peaked for sure. It's completely, I think, hope unsustainable to have a 8% top line CPI and, and 6% core. But what if it winds up at four, you know, which is sort of what I'm looking for in, in terms of core because of that. And then also the demographic situation where it's hard to get people to work and, you, you know, you just got to pay more money to work. So let's say you had 4% core CPI, unless you vehemently disagree with that, and you've got a 10-year yield at 2.9. How is that sustainable over any long period of time? Okay, uh, good point. Um I don't disagree with that, say, 4%. All I can say is direction, position, intensity for CPI rate of change, pointing uh, cycle top now, up, over, down, approaching. This is a monthly data series. In two months, um, it was actually, and by the way, it was down. So the rate of change was down three-tenths of a percent here uh, in this report today from last month. Um, I think that may have been the peak in the rate of change for the CPI. And so I looked at both rate of change and the level, and both are scheduled to point go down in two to three months. So uh, all I can say is direction down, position just starting or about to start, intensity as strong as it gets. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, what the world is facing, <laughs> and this will sound totally contrarian to what everyone is thinking, we're facing a deflationary event, and it's going to be the stock market. There's no more stimulus, you know, $9 trillion, uh, $9.5 trillion of stimulus out the window, over. Central banks, QE, over. Low negative interest rates, over. Um, and what it's going to do to the business cycle, and, and by the way, all the uh, industrial stuff that I follow, like European auto makers, you know, Volkswagen, Porsche, things like that. Big I models, shorts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so those are shorts to me. Okay, they're really over-owned. Um, they're, they, they are forecast to underperform. So I see, uh, basically, my, I guess my answer to you is we are slowly but surely, not, on the, not instantaneously, but we are rolling over into a deflationary, uh, 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 an event which is going to uh, result in a major economic global downturn. And that's going to take the price of base metals down. China might bounce back, but all the real estate stuff is a disaster there. So I don't think it's off to the races. And um, uh, in terms of long-term trend analysis, I put this chart in my report this week. The 30-year um, yield just rallied all the way up to its 200-month average. That's 200-month not 200 week. And those long-term averages almost never get hit. And when they do, it's very significant. So I think we've hit a major inflection point in pretty much everything. And um, you can see that in trend analysis. With it, Just do a 30-year 30, 30 yield, 200-month average. You'll see same thing with the 30-year bond, TLT. It's right on the 200-month average. And by the way, China, here's, here's a weird oddball one for you. The Chinese stock market, that is the Morgan Stanley uh, emerging market um, China index, which is basically Hong Kong traded Chinese stocks, is right on the 200 month average. And but that level is down 50% for the S&P, down 60% for the NASDAQ. So I think my long term forecast for the NASDAQ is down 60 from here, down 50 for the S&P. The, the Chinese market is already there. And um, I, it's not a buy. I'm still short China, but I'm looking ahead. And China is much uh, closer to coming out of this mess, you know, you know than they, they've been, the market's been going down in liquidation for a long time. But you tie, tie it all up. Global top and everything, peak everything. Economy goes down, drags commodities down, interest rates probably peaked, bonds start rallying. Not Europe yet, just U.S. Um, I, we'll see about Europe. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Okay. I, I guess... Well, there's a noise on there I'm hearing. Okay, yeah. thank you. I, right. I, I, so, I, I guess we'll kind of disagree. I don't disagree on the trend, 
but I, I see more of a stagflationary environment. And it sounds as if you're looking for a, a deflationary environment, right? Outright deflationary, yeah. right? Like you expect negative prints on inflation coming up? Um, I would say deflation in terms of equity prices first. And so we get margin liquidation. The stock market goes down 50%. I guarantee you consumer confidence is going to go and consumer spending are going to fall through off the chart. And so consumer sales will go down. All of a sudden, all these companies that are counting on these big increases in sales and margin, everything's going to be a disaster. And Goldman Sachs will be saying, well, we've decided to finally downgrade Tesla because I go, oh, <laughs> so, so um, that's what's ahead. Deflation in financial assets first. I'm not saying negative CPI yet, but just downward pressure on prices. And inflation is a rate of change, okay? And I, I hate to be, agree with the Fed about anything, but they've been saying, you know, inflation, the rate of change will will stop going up. I, I do agree with them. Like, so we have this, uh, we have the uh, the big increase in energy prices, uh, and it's kind of run its course. So long, it's a deflation first in financial asset prices drives consumer spending, retail sales down. Um, the market, stock market goes down. We go into a. It's not the end of the world. It's a business cycle contraction, but global, and it causes the prices of uh, economically sensitive things to go down and interest rates to decline. Thank well, you, thank you. If, if, can, can I ask another question? I, I hope yeah, I'm not yeah, boring yeah, people. Mark, like, Mark, Mark, Mark yeah. Mark, just, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You can ask all the questions you want. Um, I just, you know, we, we talk a lot of macro in this room. We'd love to have you in this room all the time because we talk about all these questions all the time. So ask as many questions as you want, but I would like to get on to your, your area of expertise, if you don't mind. Uh, okay. So no, 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 no. Do one more question. And let's move on to things. Well, I, I just energy, wanted to your, ask your, your... Michael, how, you know, how you can say energy is peaked when, when Brent is 107 with China closed. I, I mean... And again, I don't mean to sound critical, and I have no oil position. I am not long energy at all. So yeah, it's but, not... but, 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 Mark, but Mark Spiegel, I think the difference, I don't think there's a disagreement here. I think what's happening is you're focusing on the why, and he's focusing on the what. So he's just telling well, me what he sees. No, hold on. Okay. What he all sees right. in the okay. charts and his pattern, he's not putting a, a narrative with it. So, But you, you've got a narrative or your view of the world, and so you guys are trying to reconcile the two. So... You're asking him to give fundamental justification for what he sees in the charts, but that's not the way. That's not his approach. Okay. Okay. So, Fine. Anyway, so, so thanks. And those are great questions, and, and we're all much wiser for for your uh, for, for for your questions. That's fantastic. You, you, you know, because I, I do look at charts, and and if something is going along great, supposedly fundamentally, and the chart is telling me differently, and something's breaking down, I'm like whoa, whoa, something's wrong here. But if the chart's breaking down and I can come up with an extremely, to me, obvious reason for it, then I'd be like, well, obviously spot, you know, whatever. Anyway, go ahead. Point taken. Uh, no, so, what uh, do you so, want to talk about? No, so I, I, <laughs> I want to know what you want to talk about. So, um, so you know, the floor is yours. You want to riff on the electric car companies? I, let's start off with a question. Let's start off with a question, okay? You and I have been, start, been talking about Tesla for years. Um, and, and Mark, just mute yourself when you're not talking because we can hear the sirens in the background. Yeah, the sounds of New York City. Yeah, yeah go you, ahead. You just, just, just mute yourself while you're not speaking, please. Thank you. So you and I have been talking on Tesla for years. And let's be honest, we've been wrong. We've been wrong. Okay. All right. You want to take a victory lap because it's 700 down from whatever, 1,200, fine. But in the bigger scheme of things, you and I were doing bear porn talk on Tesla years ago. And the extraordinary thing about Tesla is you know, I was brought up, I think you were brought up the same way. And you know, Peter Lynch used to say, you tell me a company's going to earn, I'll tell you what the stock price is going to do. And I'm old enough to remember when, as the saying goes, you and I were having the conversation in the second quarter of 2019. Tesla was on the ropes. The bonds were yielding double digits. The stock was 160. Pre-split, boys and girls, that's 32 in present form. It's 700-something right now. And I was playing for bankruptcy, and you were also. And, you know, he bullshitted his way out of it. It's funny, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to be a little careful what I say, but I'm also speaking the truth, because he admits in the subsequent you know, interviews and whatever magazine articles, and you've got an encyclopedic knowledge of all this, Mark, so you'll fill in us all the gruesome details. He talks about how they came within inches of going bankrupt in the second quarter of, of uh, I think it was 19. And, you know, I played for bankruptcy. It didn't happen. I don't like valuation shorts. I've tried that enough in my life. It doesn't work. It's a bad way, to, no way to go through life. I covered it. 
That's fine. I've lost money on shorts. I mean, I actually made money on that short, but I lost a ton of money on Tesla shorting previously. And other than the occasional, you know, dabble here and there, and I'm, I'm back in a little bit, but my view is there's just easier things to short. I mean, why would you short Tesla when you can short Carvana? You know, it's, it's all right. So any event, so I guess the question I'm going to ask you, Mark, is, and this is maybe testimony to just how screwed up the market is, and we live in this post-truth society driven by narrative and liquidity, and nobody does any work, and nobody cares. And Elon Musk is a sort of Tony Stark type of guy, character that everyone wants to, you know, be, be, be in cahoots with. He's going to save the world, and we're all against, you know, global warming, and so on and so forth. So I guess, Mark, you know, what have you learned? We go back to, and, and please, I don't want to hear about how Tesla's gone down the last few months. That's irrelevant, okay? We're talking, and, and the funny thing is, we've been right on the fundamentals. That's the why is thing. why? Excuse me. Why is it relevant that it went up uh, to 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 obscene overvaluation, but it's not relevant that it's coming down? No, no, no. Because I'm trying to frame a question here, Mark. Okay. Okay. Commentary <laughs> in the market. Okay. How could we have been so right on on, on the on the fundamentals? And the stock, you know, went up, whatever it was, 20, 30 X in our right. face. Okay. That's what I want to talk about. We will get to, we'll get to, okay, it's blowing up now. And like, right. There was no, there was, there was, there was zero learning experience here. You know why? Tesla is a one in 10,000 stocks fluke, maybe a one in 50,000 stocks fluke, right? Some of it, maybe a lot of it was that crazy gamma squeezing, right? Maybe we'll, one day we'll learn who was behind it. That was a huge part of it. But even putting that aside, you can't invest in the future based on a one in 10,000 or one in 20,000 stocks fluke because the other 9,999 times, you're going to hurt yourself. So my answer is I, I lost nothing from Tesla. Fortunately, I'm making back a lot on the way down of what I lost on the way up. And right. You know, at seven hundred and thirty-four dollars, that's still an eight hundred billion dollar market uh, cap, uh, yeah, right? Uh, yeah, Mark, 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 so, Mark, 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 hundred percent. Just hold it. We're going to get into Tesla bashing in a minute. I just, uh, I, I, no, just hold on, just hold on, please, please stay with me because I want people to understand, learn, learn what's going on in the room. I mean, that I don't think I've never seen in my forty-one years. I got a few years on you, but you're a grizzled veteran as well. I've never seen another market environment. In any place, not even Japan, where something this screwed up was possible. I mean, yeah, there are bubbles here and there, but to go to you know from a company that's you know cost taxpayers billions of dollars, accumulating lost money, and then the guy winds up you know with a whatever it was a trillion two market cap and the richest guy in the world on what a story and a narrative like that was never possible for like my mind prior to having seen this happen. Would have, would have said it's just not possible. And to me, what it's all symptomatic of or indicative of, it's how equities and financial asset prices are, are so much more now than ever have been an indication of just how much liquidity is in the system. And he may say, well, it's always the case, but they took, you know. No, this was a fluke. Yeah. There's no question. But but but, so, a, fluke, but a fluke that went like 10 standard deviations beyond. Oh, anything okay, fine. Ever so you know what I've learned? The What's next that? time the Fed starts printing. Uh, 120 billion dollars a month and sets real interest rates at negative 200. I won't fucking short anything until they stop. <laughs> I, right, I, I mean, right. you know, I, I don't think that's going to happen again. Uh, if it does, my gold will do fantastically. But, you know, I'm saying like it's hard to say this was such a fluke. Right. I mean, I, I've spoken to so many guys, you know, many of them, you know, and and you've all you've heard of all of them very famous guys just over this tesla thing and and to to a man to a, they were all men but to a person they said you know mark I, i've been in this business 50 years i've never seen anything like this i've been in this business 40 years so and, and these are guys running you know uh, you know tens of billions of dollars sometimes so what can you learn from that i mean the next time you see a tesla are you not going to short it I, I I mean, it was just, no, no, it was no, a fluke. Was, yeah, so I, I think what, it, what your answer was really is saying in a different way, you and I could never countenance that we would have such irresponsible monetary policy. It's not about Elon yes. Musk becoming a G. It, 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 it's, we know the bankers don't know what the hell they're doing, but this was like multiple standard deviations beyond what's ever been seen in the history of mankind. Would that be a fair way of saying it? Yeah, that's a fair way of saying it, except... It, except it's one thing if a stock goes from, you know, if a stock that's worth, you know, a billion, you know, goes to goes to 10 billion. But 
to, to, I, I never thought that you could support a trillion dollar market cap with a bubble, right? You'd think, no, there's no way. But I guess if you look at the somewhat restricted float, because, you know, Musk had a lot of it. And, and then you look at the, that, that gamma squeeze. I mean, every Monday morning, like clockwork, right? So right. I, I just, I don't know what, if, if I ever thought I'd, if I ever see that again, I guess I'll have learned something, but I don't think we'll ever see it again. And I don't think you can, I don't think you can invest around a fluke. It's, you know what that is? Let me tell you, that's the, that's the mirror image of everybody thinks they own the next Amazon, right? How many times have you heard, well, Amazon, blah, 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 blah. And it, you know, went to $2 trillion. Well, Amazon was also a one in 10,000 stocks stock, right? So you can't invest thinking you have the next Amazon. You can't be afraid of shorting because you're afraid you have the next Tesla. I mean, if you short at all, which maybe is right. a fucking stupid thing to do anyway. No, that, that, that's <laughs> great. All right, all right, all right. Okay. So, so, okay. So with that, Mark, with, with that, Mark, because you'll have plenty of questions. So with that, Mark, to pass this prologue, let's do a mark to market. Okay. So let's say you're not, ha you're not happy because you made money shorting Tesla the last few months. You're not upset because you lost a lot of money shorting Tesla the last few years. You come down from planet Mars. Well, let's keep it simple, okay? I'm going to be Jeremy Irons in, in, in margin call, okay? So, Mr. Stanfield, I understand you, you, you know something about this. Um, could you please explain to me <laughs> why Tesla has an $800 billion market cap? So, okay, has no moat. China sells it down 19, 98%. Pretend I'm a small child or a golden retriever. Mr. Stanfield? <laughs> a very good impression uh, go a great scene by the way go, great go scene. um i think that that um there is a part of it is it's it's among the people who own it part of it is a a cult religion um but i think a lot of it is uh among the, the it's got a massive retail ownership component i mean if you take away the s p 500 index thing right I, I don't know if there's any real institutions left in this of, of any size i mean you know there's there's ron Barron who's like i don't know i don't know if he's full of shit or just a befuddled old man at this point but i mean he comes out there oh i'm gonna make another 10x on my tesla tesla only has 15 moving parts i mean he just spews bullshit on on cnbc and and didn't get called on it and got very lucky on this stock you know or maybe he knew something i don't know um so you know <laughs> <laughs> to answer your question, I think I think people didn't realize that there's no moat there. I mean, that's the bottom line, right? I mean, when when Tesla had 75 percent market share or 80 percent of in the U.S. of electric cars, and that's what people saw, they're like, oh, they they you know, people thought they had a moat. There's no moat. I mean, right now you can buy 10 cars with better real world range than Tesla, and all of them are better built, right? Because they're not. They're not made in tents and they don't have giant panel gaps or whatever. So I, I, I think the answer is what's happening now. People are realizing, oh, wait a second. My neighbor just bought that Kia EV6 and that's a hell of a nice electric car and I'd rather own it than a Tesla. Here, here was my I'll give you my I'll give you my mistake if you want to ask what I learned about this. OK, every car you see out there today, the Mercedes EQS, you know, all the great new EVs, the, the Ionic 5, you know, the BMW iX and i4, all these cars, these cars were all announced, you know, not in the, in the specifics, but they were telegraphed five years ago. You know, five years ago, you know, um, uh, Hyundai said, we're going to spend whatever, I'm pulling a number out of my ass, $12 billion on electric cars over the next five years. And, and in the year 2021, 20, uh, we're going to introduce these great cars, right? And they said this in 2016 or whatever. So I thought, oh, well, this is obvious. You know, the stock market discounts, you know, future information that's known. And everybody's going to look at this and say, oh, yeah, Tesla has this super hot cars now, but we're buying this thing, you know, putting a multiple on earnings that are 15 or 20 years out. But in five years, Everybody's going to have great electric cars. Well, the market didn't do it. It didn't look beyond the tip of its nose, right? And so, and now it's looking beyond the tip of its nose. Of course, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, disassociate, if that's the word, what's happening with Tesla with with Fed policy and what's happening with the overall market, right? I, I don't know what Fed would be, what Tesla would be doing right now if rates were still zero and the Fed was still you know, dovish and, and was still printing money. Maybe it would still be up there and maybe all these cars around wouldn't make a damn difference because, you know, look, there was a long time and maybe even now I haven't looked lately when you could plot, you know, over since since they introduced the Bitcoin futures contract, 
Um, and, and, and if you plotted a weekly chart against Tesla over those four years, now maybe it's closer to five years, they, they mirrored each other almost exactly, right? To the point where Tesla essentially became you know, the Bitcoin of stocks. I mean, I, I'm sure you know what I think about Bitcoin. I mean, it's just, it's nonsense. It's just another gambling instrument when, when they printed too much money. So, you know, maybe maybe it just became completely disassociated from fundamentals. So, you know, look, this takes this takes us back to what I said five minutes ago is, is maybe the best lesson is, you know, when the Fed is setting real rates negative and printing a trillion dollars a year, just don't short anything. You know, if you have to go to cash, if you can't find cheap longs, if you're a value guy or even a GARP guy. I mean, you, there weren't even very many GARP stocks to buy in this environment. So 100%. does that answer your question? Yeah, 100 percent, Mark. OK, so, Mark, let's now go to your area of expertise. You can do it in your sleep. You're probably tired of talking about it. But this room, we want to talk facts. We want to know you, what you specific. Let's focus on the car company itself. Could you speak to and I'll ask you the leading questions like right here, like, you know, how is, you know, how is it set up now in Tesla? And I don't want to talk about number go up, bro, and the, and, and the retail leads. Forget about that. Let's talk about what's actually going on with the company. As Soros used to say, as once said, the way you make money in the market is figure out what is it the market believes it's not true. And then more importantly, when does the market realize it's going to be had? So whether it's their market share collapsing in Europe, it's EVs coming to the U.S., it's China, you know, the sales collapsing in China. Let's start with the fundamentals. I know it's a quaint old notion, but that's the way I was brought up and you were brought up. So let's just talk about what is the change at the margin in the fundamentals for Tesla right now? And, and I totally agree with you. Tesla has a moat. Just explain to people what's really going on with Tesla from a fundamental base. We're not going to talk about number grow up, bro. We're not talking about the stock price. We're talking about the fundamentals. I'm sorry to be so anal about it, but could you speak to the fundamentals, please? Well, a um, <laughs> couple of things. You know, you know, but you know, Bulls and even Musk hinted at it, but but now he says, "Oh, it's it's um, what's the word?" He says, um, "It's a goal." I forget the word he uses. You know, to to sell twenty million cars a year in ten years, right? Which a lot of these idiot Tesla bulls think will happen. You'd have to build a new five hundred thousand car factory. I, I think you know. Oh, they said in ten years. I'm sorry, not in twenty. You'd have to build a new five hundred thousand a year factory every six months for the next 10 years and sell out, you know, full capacity. Right. So fundamentally there were, there was no growth in unit deliveries in, in Q1, the, the quarter just reported versus Q4 of, of 2021. This is going to be a down quarter. Now the problem with that of course is they're constricted on, on chips. And, and of course China was closed this quarter and whatever. So the bulls are not going to believe that peak Tesla demand is somewhere probably fewer than 2 million cars a year worldwide. Right now they're at a, a run rate of about, you know, between a million two and a million three. They're not going to believe that until there are no shortage of chips and all the factories are open and all of a sudden, holy shit, we've, they've got over capacity. I mean, the cheapest Tesla you can buy now in the U S is $47,000. The cheapest, uh, small crossover. The Model Y is sixty-two or sixty-three thousand dollars. There is not, there is not a big enough crowd in the world to pay those kind of prices, you know, for cars to let this company grow the way people think it's going to grow. So fundamentally, the delivery numbers are flat, you know, sequentially last quarter. They're going to be negative this quarter, but you know. It, until people can see that, hey, you can order a Tesla today and get it in custom built in three or four weeks, they're not going to believe that there is a – certain people are not going to believe that there is a, a demand limitation to this company. They're going to be deluded into thinking, oh, they can sell as many cars as they can make forever. But what might change their mind is if they – their neighbor gets that Kia EV6 and they go for a ride in it, right? And then they say, oh, wait a second, you know, or a Mercedes EQS or or whatever, you know? I mean, well, I still laugh when I hear people, there are actually still people who say, oh, well, Tesla's five years ahead of everybody. Really? Have you have you driven a Porsche Taycan? <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, there's no freaking comparison other than a few tenths to 60 on a plaid if you're just a drag racer. But, you know, nobody's a drag racer and it's, it's pretty nauseating going to 60 and anywhere under, you know, three and a half seconds anyway, at least for me. So Yeah, so, yeah, so Mark, so just to understand what you said, because I know you and I, it's, it's, it's shorthand. So the, the units were sequent flat, were flat sequentially. 
you think they'll be down sequentially. But the problem is the Bulls, the Vays, they're going to give him the benefit for that, the free hall pass, because he can blame it on China, he can blame it on chips. Is that basically kind of what you're saying? Well, and that's, and that's by the way, that's a fair point. I mean, they could definitely sell more cars this quarter than they will sell. There's no question. I mean, they do have the orders for that. The only question is, you know, where where are peak orders? And, you know, peak orders may, especially with... with so there's another issue. As, as constricted as Tesla is in production, y- you know, their competitors who have better cars for now are even more constricted. I mean, <clears throat> the Ford Mustang Mach-E, which is a great car, Ford just stopped taking orders for any 2022 Mach-E's because they can only build, I think it's 60,000 a year worldwide this year. However, Ford is upping Mach-E production. They're, they're tripling it to almost 200,000 a year, uh, which will be completed at some point next year. And then you're going to see a very different, you know, a different environment in which Tesla has to compete. You can get a Tesla quicker for, for all you hear about, oh, they're so sold out. You can get a Tesla quicker than you could get a Mach-E a Hyundai Ioniq 5 or a Kia EV6 right now. So it's, you know, as as constricted as Tesla is, everyone else is more constricted. So you're not going to get what what I'm telling you is going to happen. You're not going to see proof of that until these 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 constrictions go away. And then it's like, you know, then it's an open field and a fair fight. And then you're like, oh, wait a second. Tesla all of a sudden not growing so much right you know no, that, 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 you express it really well that's brilliant mark so let's just move on a little, let's drill down a little bit further did you speak to i want to focus on specifically in europe and in china because most of the folks here in north america did you speak to what's happening to their market share in europe and both in terms of market share of evs and market shares of auto sales generally and what's happening to the competitive landscapes because i understand it's been just like a a tidal wave of new models coming on the market from these little companies like called VW and BMW <laughs> and Mercedes. So, so now for the first time, they really, really, and another thing which is different now, they really have serious competition for the first time. So could you please speak to the competitive situation in both uh, uh, Europe and China? Well, so in China, Tesla, Tesla market share of, of, of BEVs, battery electric cars, which is a, a narrower category that, that would, of, of what they call new energy vehicles, which I think includes plug-in hybrids and stuff. So Tesla's BEV share in China, <clears throat> excuse me, is down to like 11%, or it was last quarter. Um, so, and in Europe, their share ticked up a little bit to about 13%, which is still roughly half of VWs um, because of the, the, the supply constrictions from everybody else. Volkswagen and Mercedes have both said that they're basically sold out of electric cars for the year. Right. I mean, Volkswagen, I think, has, if I'm not mistaken, 300,000 back orders for its ID3, ID4 series, you know. So, um, I mean, that's I mean, you know, that's that's just the reality that that all these other guys are more sold out than Tesla is. Now, it's partially because they have less production capacity, but that that production capacity is coming online. And again, you know, there are only so many buyers for cars in Tesla's price range. And if you can get the same range with a much nicer interior on a BMW, you're like, why are you going to get that Tesla? You know? Right. And so, Mark, just to put it in context again, I know this is like, you, I could wake up in the middle of the night, you could recite these numbers just that look, you know, just out. But when you talk about the 11% market share in Europe and 13% market share in China or the other way around, like, give some context. Where, where were those market shares, say, a year or two ago? Well, in Europe, their, their market share of electric cars peaked at like 35 or 40 percent, I believe, a couple of years ago. So, you know, call it down from 35 or 40 or maybe it was even higher. And so I call it that, you know, now down to, to like 13. And again, it's they'll be in the single digits as soon as, you know, things open up for everybody else. Right. And then in China, I don't know what the peak was in China, probably the same probably 30 40 percent something like that i mean there are now in china i think there are like 10 different companies many of them homegrown uh averaging ten thousand electric cars a month in sales so you know to put that in context i I think tesla is selling around um oh maybe let me think for a second maybe around an average of around 30,000 a month, but it's back end loaded. So let's say Tesla sells 
a hundred thousand cars in China for the quarter. I think it was fewer than that last quarter. Well, there's a whole bunch of guys now doing thirty or forty thousand. And in fact, BYD actually outsells Tesla in China in, in, in electric cars. So, you know, the, the 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 hype of Tesla, even with the numbers we have now, is just so beyond reality. But you know, it's like you ever try to talk math to a Democrat; they just don't want to hear it. You know, so like like you, you go over numbers like the, the, what I call the test lemmings. They're like math impervious. They're fact impervious. It's a religion. You can't argue with with a person's religion. It's it's a waste of your time. They're gradually going to have to learn this on their own. And it might not be math that does it. it. It could very well be seeing their neighbor's Kia EV6 and getting a ride in it. You know, 100 percent. So uh, a couple of a few other questions. Here. We're dealing with fundamentals and facts. Um, Tesla notoriously had really, really bad quality reviews from Consumer Reports and all these other uh, automobile things. Could you speak to, I mean, it's, that shit quality, and that ties into, I always find it interesting that, you know, in the biggest automobile market in Europe, Germany, they suck. Because they, no self-respect in Germany, they look down their nose at Tesla, it's garbage. So could you speak to specifically their market share in Germany and sort of the European attitude toward Tesla's and also, what's been happening to their quality overall? Has it gotten any better, or did I see a report a couple months ago it fell down again? So, no. I mean, according to Consumer Reports, the Model Three had the highest quality; it was rated average. Every other model, the the X, and 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 by the way, every other model, they only have a total of four models, which is another joke about a, a trillion dollar company. But but the Y and the and the Model X and the Model S were all rated below average for quality. And I mean, you can see Musk just doesn't even give a shit about it. He just doesn't care. I mean, you know, like service, try getting your Tesla service. It's like a, unless you get really lucky and they have a mobile guy comes over, it's like a three, four, five, six week wait to get serviced. I mean, this is how he manages one way b besides a fraudulent warranty under reserve, speaking of reliability. But besides that, the way he manages to eke out the small profit is just by underspending on, on everything once you actually are an owner of his product, right? I mean, supposedly he used to do this for, um, uh, I don't know if it was, you know, PayPal or the one before it, when they used to just like literally unplug the phones when, when customers would call in and they needed help. He just doesn't give a shit. And I, look, I don't know how this guy has gotten as far as he has on, on well, he does it with Flash, you know? So the rockets land and they look great, but the company loses a shitload of money, right? I mean, that's, I, I don't know. He's just got, I, I guess... He's sort of an emperor with no clothes. I mean, there is a product there. I mean, people do like the product, but there were much again, there are much better products out. Look, if there were much if there were other flashy rockets out there, you know, people wouldn't have as much interest in money losing SpaceX. You know, Mark, it's funny to listen to you say that. Uh, I'm sure you've watched Mark. Have you the extra normal cartoons that appear from time to time? No, uh, never heard of it. Oh, well, there's this one hilarious. I'll, I'll send it to you later. I'm sure some of the folks in the room have heard of them. So they have, they have these characters are deadpanning. It's it's all dubbed in, and it's it's a parody type thing. So it'd be like these cartoon characters. So this one guy goes in for a job interview. Um, he's talking to a headhunter, and he wants to get an investment banking job. Don't worry, there's relevant. You'll laugh when you hear this story. So the guy goes, "I want to work for the Goldman Sachs." And the guy says, "Well, you know, you could work at UBS, and you could make twice as much money. I don't care. I want to work for the Goldman Sachs. Do you know that UBS gives you a lot more vacation time as well?" I don't care. I want to work for the Goldman Sachs. He's going on and on and on. So listening to you talk about, you know, it, it's the virtue signaling, the virtue signaling of, you know, going green. Let's not, we're not even going to get into the ESG bullshit, but, but, but one thing related to the ESG bullshit, is there even, where are we with respect to, this is maybe out of left field, or this is the middle of the non sequitur. Where are we with respect to, is there even enough, I mean, there's enough lithium in the world, but in terms of production and everything else, is there an issue with even Tesla and all these electric cars getting all the raw materials they need looking out the next few years? To well, the, yeah, you, supposedly there's a huge issue. Look, I'm not a, I'm not an expert in mining, but I keep reading story after story that, that there, there aren't enough, there might be enough lithium in the world, but there, there, there isn't enough production right now. And, and, and a lot of these metals, right? Cobalt and, and um, you know nickel and and whatever. I mean, there's shortages of all this stuff. And these and and by the way, these cars are just going to get the the funniest thing was oh the price of the electric car it's going to drop to parity with a with a gasoline car. 
you know, they keep getting more expensive because those ingredients are, are, are you know, materials are going right. up faster than the than the combustion right. engine materials, you, you, right? Yeah, yeah, stay with it. No, right, you just triggered another. You triggered me. <laughs> I almost forgot. Could you speak to if you do a fully, if an audited, fully correct carbon audit of the carbon footprint of a Tesla versus like, you know, one of the, you know what, we know I'm going with this, one of these hybrid things or whatever. Yeah. Could you, and, and not just the MPGs, but also explain to people how like all the energy you got to do to build the car, the whole thing. Could, could you speak to whether the freaking thing is even green on a relative basis? Or? Well, it's interesting that you said compared to one of these hybrid things, because when you see these studies done, and I've read a bunch of them, um, they, they typically will compare like, you know, a, um, um, a Tesla Model 3 to like a 26 mile per gallon BMW 3 Series or whatever, you know, whatever that got a couple of years ago. And in that case, it takes, I don't know what the number of years is, you know, five, six, seven years. And then allegedly the, the Tesla comes out ahead. But that's, but that's not really the comparison. I mean, if your motivation is to have a green car, okay, the Honda Accord hybrid or, or, or Toyota Camry hybrid, it's a beautiful car. It's got a much nicer interior than any Tesla. It gets 50 miles per gallon, and they cost about $20,000 less than the Tesla. Cradle to grave, a 50-mile-per-gallon hybrid is probably roughly equal to to a bev and 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 then you have to factor in the fact that that those cars can run probably 300,000 miles and god knows what the bev battery the electric car battery is going to be like at 150 or 175,000 but even assuming that's not an issue it, cradle to grave that 50 mile per gallon hybrid is probably extremely similar to the electric car especially because 60% of the the electricity comes from fossil fuels in, in this country and it's it's higher in other places. So if you if you think about that and then you think well I saved $20,000 up front, well you know you know you could plant a hell of a lot of trees for $20,000 and probably the hybrid over the lifetime probably comes out to be a lot greener than the electric car. But you never see these studies done against a 50 mile per gallon hybrid. And by the way, the, the, the Accord hybrid is zero to 60 and I think the high sixes, if I'm not mistaken. So it's not a slug. It's not like an old Prius. You, you always see it against the competing, you know, high performance gas car, which is not really the comparison somebody would make if they were prioritizing, you know, being green. If you prior, if you yep. want the greenest car, you get the greenest yep. car. Yep. So, Mark, let's move on. This is a great question. By the way, how are you on time? Because I know we started you. I apologize for it. How yeah, you let's let's say like, a, 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 I don't know how long you want to go, but let's say up to another 15 minutes, okay? Right, up to fine. 6.30? Yeah, okay, fine. 6.30 will give you a hard stop. So, <laughs> I, if you have a question for Mark, please send it to me because it's cumbersome. We, we, we want to jam as many questions as possible. Just quicker if you get, send me the questions. Anyone in the audience has a question for Mark, send it to me. So, um, could you just speak to Musk's role with Tesla's uh, relationship with the Chinese government and China and like, it seems to me they could like shut him down. You know, some people say, well, eventually when the Chinese get, you know, production gets big enough, enough models that Musk is disposable, blah, blah, blah. So can you speak to like, what do you think his, his relationship is with the Chinese government? And, and do you think it's a problem for him potentially? Well, f first of all, th there are a lot of potential conflicts there. I mean, he's definitely, hugely over reliant on China. Supposedly, I mean, Gordon Johnson has written a note about this. And, you know, if you look through the 10K and where they attribute the profits to, they all come out of China, right? Now, I don't know how much of that is just game, game playing, you know, um, you know, ta tax district shopping or whatever. But if, that, if you take it at face value, that's all the profits, right? And then, you know, he's got SpaceX. I mean, China has a lot of leverage on this guy, right? I mean, I mean, I mean, Musk is Musk. SpaceX has contracts, right, for the Defense Department and 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 I assume the NSA and the DoD for satellite launches. And you know, his entire wealth, his liquid wealth, for sure, is tied up in in Tesla, right? So, I mean, there was actually an article about this finally in the Wall Street Journal a couple months ago that some people in Congress were asking about it. But you know. <laughs> Probably nothing will come of that the way nothing comes of anything with this guy, which, by the way, to go back to where this discussion, the Tesla part of this discussion started, you know, what lesson did you learn? Well, 
when have you ever seen anybody with the kind of regulatory immunity that this guy has? When, when, when could, you, could you have ever possibly imagined the CEO of a company tweeting a fake buyout of his company and not having the board remove him that night, right? Instead, this board spent weeks trying to cover up for him and, and failed. And then when would you ever anticipate a, a moron running the SEC like Clayton who says, oh, well, you know, if we if we've uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing his letter. If we re if we remove Musk, then the stock will go down and retail investors will get hurt. Well, thanks, moron, because after that, you got guys pushing empty trucks down hills. Right. So and by the way, that guy is getting prosecuted. But but Musk isn't. Right. So that's another thing. I mean, a total fluke of regulatory yeah. immunity. Uh, yeah. So and, uh, so, so, Mark, stay with that. so so let's stay on trucks for a second when, if at all, are we going to get the semi? What's the story with the semi? I mean, supposedly the semi requires those larger diameter uh, battery cells, which, by the way, all they are is they're bigger. They're, they're not necessarily better. They're supposedly a little bit cheaper, I guess, because of, you know, something with, with this design, with the utilization of space or whatever, you know, what the 4680s or whatever they're called, which, which Tesla, this is another funny story I tweeted about this today. So there's a story that came out today that, Tesla is apparently begging Panasonic to please hurry up and open that factory to make us 4680 batteries. So this is Tesla, the quote unquote battery company, right? They're begging the real battery maker to make them their batteries. So do your point about the semi, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's been f forever and supposedly there's only one of them. And in fact, and they just, they, they paint it different colors, but there's already, by the way, there's, I think three companies that have electric semis on the road now um the uh, freightliner i think has it volvo has it and somebody else has it and so but people don't pay attention to that but nobody's really talking so much about the semi it's the pickup truck that people were talking about a lot but you know what the ford f-150 which is now rolling out right now and the reviews the embargoes on the on the on the reviews actually broke today so you can find a bunch of reviews online got astounding reviews that cyber truck or uh, as i like to call it the, the cyber fuck that thing is just a joke in terms of design for anybody who buys a pickup truck it's that, that you know before you bring a product on the market if you're going to do it right you need a fleet of a hundred of them driving around the world you know testing in all conditions for a year right Th there's no fleet of a hundred cyber trucks there's one there's one model that they showed a few times now will tesla just do what it did in the past and just start building it and the you know the customers become the fleet testers well maybe i don't know but they're, they're so far behind on the truck i mean gm has the electric silverado coming uh next year and and the semi was was just a niche product anyway that some greenwashing companies you know pepsi whatever put in orders for who knows if they'll ever see it i mean you know here's the thing if this guy were serious about this this guy had a stock and it still does that, that was so obscene, they could have raised a lot more money. They could have developed a whole line of products across the board. Instead, they just skimped on everything as much as possible to show tiny profits to, to drive up the price of the stock. And, you know, obviously for Musk to start cashing out. I mean, the guy cashed out a, a, a lot of money right near the top. The guy, the guy, Just the money the guy cashed out near the top, which is a small percentage of his holdings, probably makes him one of the 20 wealthiest guys in the world, right? So he pulled an amazing scam here. Let's put it right. that way. Mark, uh, we've got a whole bunch of questions here. Let's just kind of do uh, rapid rapid fire. Uh, any special insights on the his, his personal financial situation? A lot of people are speculating the Twitter deal might break, blah, 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 break a fee, blah, blah, blah. You know, how much is uncovered, unencumbered? Do you have any particular insights <laughs> on, the, on the Twitter situation? I mean, look at Twitter. It's right now as we're talking, it's trading in the 45s, for God's sake. This is the biggest spread in history, if anyone thought it was going to happen. Um, no, and it's impossible to know because, you know, based on the on the number of shares that, that it says in the proxy that he has borrowed against, um, you know, it, I mean, with a $700 stock, even at, I don't know, 20% LTV, I mean, he's got a lot of room there. So there's something weird there. Either he borrowed a lot more money than anybody knows, and God knows what he, I mean, not even he could, you know, could put 60 billion up his nose, right? So God knows where that, where that money went. 
Um, or he actually has a lot more leeway than, than, than people are saying, which is what I sort of suspect. I mean, I don't think there's any way that guy right. could have spent tens right. of billions right. of dollars. Right. Right. So yeah. He's got a capacity there. So just a slightly different uh, uh, perspective on that transaction. I kind of find it interesting that he did this, and whether it's because he just wants to, you know, control the, the, the speech laws on Twitter, or or it's a giant misdirection play. It's commentary on what's actually going on with, tw- with Twitter. It's like, you know, don't look over here, look over there. And so now, you know, Elon Musk loves to be the topic of conversation. It's like yeah. Donald, uh, Donald Trump. All conversations go, all, all, yep. all, 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 okay. So now the Twitter thing, it's like, I mean, I was at a month ago when it first got announced. I was at visiting, I don't know, one of the botanical gardens. There's like a young couple walking behind me with their baby. And the guy's going on about Twitter and Musk. I'm like, holy shit. So, so sort of strategically, do you have any thoughts about why he's doing this? Um, yeah, I, I think for, for one thing, he'd love to be able to <clears throat> remove. I mean, it's got to it's got to stick in his craw that, that there were a number of people on Twitter, obviously far beyond me, uh, who call him out continually on his bullshit. And he probably hates that. Right. So, you know, part of it is, you know, despite what he says, I'm sure he's going to eliminate those people. And the other part is. You know, it's probably just on a whim. He probably thought it would be good to do it. I, I, I don't know. I, all right, all right. Let's not go. Yeah. Can you talk about the insurance, the angle, and the insurance thing, and the, their insurance business, as well as the cost of insuring Teslas? Could you speak to that? Well, the, the, the cost of insuring Teslas, from what I've read, and I haven't really studied it, is high for various reasons. Probably the biggest reason is just how expensive they are to repair because of the aluminum. But – I did read, you know, they set up their own insurance business, which I think is just a broker, right, with somebody behind them. And I haven't really studied it. But I did happen to see a complaining tweet from a blue checkmark person on Twitter a couple of days ago, which I retweeted, where they said, hey, um, I have your insurance. And the adjuster said, you haven't hired anywhere near enough people. And each adjuster is responsible for 200 accidents. And it's going to be like months before I can get my car fixed. So that's just Musk in operation. Again, he'll sell you the product. He'll, he'll hire plenty of salespeople to sell you the product. And then there's no, then there's no service there. But listen, it, 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 there's no way that fucking Elon Musk knows better about pricing insurance than Warren Buffett does. Right. What else do I have to say? There you go. All right. Let, 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 let's, you're doing great, Mark. I'm putting you through your paces real quick. Um, so self-driving cars. To me, it seems like complete vaporware bullshit with, with Tesla. Could you speak to just competitively where they are, the lies? Is it ever going to happen? When is it going to happen? Well, it's never going to happen uh, the way they're doing it, which is just using cheap, low-resolution cameras for sure. I mean, right now, uh, Cruise, which is majority owned by GM, is operating literally – self-driving cars in San Francisco as a taxi service. There isn't even a driver. And of course, uh, Waymo is doing the same thing in the Phoenix area, and they're both going to expand to other cities. And what's and my favorite thing is, you know, the test lemmings will go, oh, well, that's geofenced. You know, they can only do that in the city of San Francisco or in the city of Phoenix, you know, because they have the maps and this Tesla solution will work anywhere. Well, I, I have news for those people. The Waymo car and the Cruise car will be better in any possible environment than the Tesla car because they have LiDAR and they have radar, neither of which uh, Tesla has. Tesla actually used to have radar at one point and they removed it, uh, presumably because they couldn't get chips for it, right? So they're, they're the only, you know, other companies were like, okay, we have to um, eliminate your, <coughs> your Apple CarPlay but we'll give you the chip later. Or, you know, we'll sell you the car for $500 less because we don't have that chip. Musk literally eliminated safety systems, right? He eliminated the entire backup steering system for his cars. Now, you can't have, assuming all your self-driving stuff works, you need a backup steering system for safety, apparently, with those. He eliminated it. So, because he couldn't get the chips. There was a good article about this. I think Laura Kolodny at CNBC wrote it. So, you know, even if he had the hardware, he doesn't have the hardware, and he and he doesn't have the the hardware anyway for self driving. So it's just bullshit. It's a promotion. It's amazing to me that that he's been. A, this is more regulatory immunity. I mean, does the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, do they let anybody sell a a complete bullshit product for you know for six years and charge ten thousand dollars for it? I don't know why there aren't more class action lawsuits over it. I know there are some, but. You know, but I could tell you this, by the way, even 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 people buying Teslas are sort of hip to that. And supposedly the take rate on full self-driving now is pretty tiny, like 
you know, supposedly less than 10%, where at one point it was much yeah. higher. So, Mark, we're running short on time. Does Tesla have any competitive advantage in anything? Well, the the only competitive advantage, well, <clears throat> it, it has, it has, call it two competitive advantages. One it, is it has more production capacity as of now, but that's going away over the next couple of years. There's going to be plenty of production capacity for everybody else. And by the way, it's important to say that, hey, I'm not saying that the, the Mustang Mach-E is the Tesla killer, right? I'm not saying the Ionic 5 or the EV6 or the Tesla, but it's just going to be deaf by a thousand cuts for Tesla. I mean, Hyundai is selling 120,000 a year each uh, of the Ionic 5 and the, and the EV6. And it, there's no question that a large chunk of those sales are coming out of Tesla's growth, right? So, you know, there's, and, and same thing with the Mustang Mach-E. So, the answer is that advantage of production capacity goes away pretty quickly. And then the other one is the, the last sort of moat is, is the charging system, which has just been bigger and more reliable than any other individual system. But those are all getting built out now by other people. And in fact, Tesla is being forced to open up its chargers to everybody else in order to get it's in order to meet the rules of Europe and in order to get various subsidies here. So that last moat is going away. Also, concurrently, the OEMs are getting much more serious about providing reliable charging, you know, like Electrify America and, and these other systems. Ford actually now has a team of people dedicated to driving around, testing these chargers and making sure that they're working right. So that that moat's going away, too, very quickly. Certainly far, far, far within, same thing with the production one, far, far, far within the, the perspective of, oh, I'm buying this company based on, you know, my 2035 earnings projections or whatever. Do they have any innovation or technology advantage? Uh, not anymore. I mean, if you look, if you look at the, just look at the numbers. It used to be range, but forget the EPA number. I mean, Tesla self-certifies its range, and in the real world, it never makes it. Okay, multiple people test these, and they're like, Tesla's range is bullshit. They lie about it. Um, but in, but in terms of real world range, you can see Inside EVs runs tests all the time of every new model, as does Edmunds. And, you know, Tesla, I mean, Tesla is still in the leading pack, but they're matched by a whole bunch of other people. Right. So, yeah. So, Mark, let me just read you a question I got from someone really smart, smart. <laughs> Normally, I'd let them ask you questions, but we're short on time. So I'm trying to cram this. Go I'll right. go. I, I, if you want, I can go another 10 minutes here. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Playing devil's advocate. I feel Tesla advantage comes from their battery production, which is the bottleneck faced by most other suppliers. Ford is two years away from building a new EV factory. So in the short term. They can all. They can still be a dominant player. Tesla also has an innovation advantage, which you say me doesn't exist. But I would compare it to the early days of the iPhone and Android, when we all thought that Apple would be destroyed when Android mo makers flooded the market with cheap phones. What would you say to that? Well, two things. Number one, Tesla doesn't make its goddamn batteries. I mean, this guy should do his homework. Tesla buys its batteries in China from CATL. Okay, they'll sell them to anybody. They buy its batteries here from Panasonic. That Gigafactory, the Panasonic half of it in Nevada, or, or the or the you know part of it, that's operated by Panasonic. Panasonic will sell to anybody. Tesla's begging Panasonic to open up a new factory to build those larger format batteries, the forty whatever they are, forty six twenty whatever the hell they are. Anyway, Panasonic has explicitly said we are willing to sell these to anybody and would be happy to. So you know this is just this is just a typical person who has not done any homework whatsoever what was the right. second question there was uh, the second part they were they were let, let me go on to another question i'll come back to, to the, wait wait give me his second question because it was another okay, display so, of ignorance uh, so, so. <laughs> hold on i gotta find the thing where the heck I, let, let me let me ask the other question while i'm finding it because i it, it there's so many questions here the next question was um how much money given given the ramp in, in capex like how many billion, does tesla how many billions of dollars I mean, here's the thing. The market cap of Tesla is so out of whack with the actual sales and the cash flow. Um, you know, it, 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 it's funny. Like, it, it, I'm, I'm ranting here a little bit. But someone called me, he asked me the other day, said, well, you know, it was in the last space web. The price of Bitcoin is collapsing. And, you know, isn't that going to hurt Tesla? I'm like, dude, they only have a billion and a half dollars worth of Bitcoin. It could go down 90%. It's not going to matter. But in this sort of narrative-driven world that we're in, that's what people focus on. So question. When it comes to real money, real cash flow, how many billions of dollars does Tesla would Tesla have to pay 
uh, shell out to, to fund all these factories they have to build. And also, just compare CapEx budgets uh, of Tesla or R&D budgets, CapEx budgets of Tesla to the competition. So it really gets to the capital intensity. One, how much would they have to spend in billions of CapEx going forward? And two, you know, I always it's always useful, you know, these other auto companies have forgotten more about making cars than Tesla will ever know. They spend multiples of what Tesla does on R&D and, and, and they have enormous economies of scale. So I guess the, the two questions, the capital intensity of, of the way <laughs> Tesla, if they're going to build all these factories, and two, just put into sort of comparison to more graphic relief, the relative size of the R&D budgets of all these companies. Well, to, to build uh, 20, let's say 20 million cars a year, which is the, the, the goal, the bogey that people talk about, as I said, you, you would need, I don't know, say uh, 36 probably more factories at, at half a million each above what you've got now, something like that, right? So um, if each factory costs, I don't know, a billion and a half, I mean, you'd probably have 50 billion of CapEx. But here's an interesting point, and and you sort of mentioned it, but we you didn't really get into it. You would think with, well, at one point they had a, a, a one point three trillion dollar market cap but even now it's 800 billion you'd think oh it'd be pretty easy you know for them to raise 50 billion but apparently you know when real money when real selling comes into this as opposed to a bunch of computers just flipping it back and forth all day the stock fucking plunges i mean musk sold <clears throat> how many shares did musk recently sell was it about eight million shares something like that yeah, and, it's a reasonable guess to go on, yeah. And, and and that took an eight million shares from him over, you know, a week, you know, something like that, over four four or five days, took the stock down a hundred dollars a share, right? I mean, this is like this is not a liquid stock, right? So a, a lot of it was just float restricted for a very long period of time. So, you know, if Tesla went out and sold, you know, ten million shares. Tomorrow, it would probably plunge it down another, you know, right. hundred and fifty dollars right. a share or hundred dollars right. a share or whatever. Right. So right. the capex is tough now on R and D. Here's the thing, you know, people say, well, Tesla spends, you know, so much on R and D, but other companies spend way more on R and D, and and but not necessarily on a on a per on a per car produced basis. But that's because. You know, um, Volkswagen sells eight or nine million cars a year, and Toyota says ten sells ten million cars a year, right? And 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 GM sells six million cars a year, and it doesn't. You know, it, if you're going to design a new car, you know, it doesn't. It's you don't save any money on the R and D because you're only going to build a hundred thousand of them versus two million of them, right? So if you have a company such as Tesla, which only sold you know a run rate of one point three million cars. Well, of course, it's going to look higher per car sold in R&D. But in reality, what matters is the absolute spend, not the per car spend, because there's no economy of scale in R&D. you got to design that car with no matter how many of them you're going to sell. Right. So right. if you look going forward, I mean, I mean, the big OEMs have committed tens of billions of dollars to this thing, which, by the way, I should mention. And again, you know, it was sort of an interesting contrast to <clears throat> the guy, the nice guy, the, the technical guy I was talking to, um, um, Mike, <clears throat> at the beginning when he said he's short VW and, and, and because he thinks it's peaked and everybody owns it. I mean, you can't say everybody. Look at a freaking chart of VW. It said it's multi-year lows. It's literally selling it right. at, at five and a half times this year's earnings estimates. Now, and, and and normally you'd say, well, those are peak earnings, and that's that's what you know normalize the earnings, and it's whatever. But you can't argue that it's peak earnings when their production capacity is down thirty percent or forty percent, and they've got a one year waiting list for their cars, right? So the yes, the pricing has been great, but I'm sort of of the 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 feeling that the earnings you're seeing now from 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 um, from Volkswagen and GM and maybe the rest of the industry. These, I think, are sort of median normalized earnings with the excellent pricing being offset by the fact that they can't build anywhere near as many cars as they can sell. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and if you subscribe to that, and I'm long, I'm long VW and I'm long GM, both about five and a half times earnings or so, then I think they're both reasonable doubles over the next couple yeah, of years. Go ahead. Mark, I'm going to weigh in as, as the auto analyst back in the day. I yeah. was part of my career as an auto analyst. I was lucky enough to... Uh, 
Then the auto analyst and Peter Lynch went to Detroit and visited Chrysler. And I was there all day with the Iacocca and I went to Ford and GM and I learned a lot. So, you know, autos and white was my first industry that I covered. Yeah. And, and, and no, you're, you're a hundred percent right. A hundred percent right. And, and the other, th- the other thing I'd say about that, what people miss is I know you know this, so it's just the interest of time. You need not weigh in up. I, I, I pour gas on your fire, no pun intended. We've had below trend. I mean, I know we're going to get a recession probably to get all that, but you've seen an under um, uh, auto sales have been below trend because of lack of supply. So there's this pent up demand for uh, new cars, which will manifest itself when we get through whatever economic downturn that we're likely to have. Let me move on to another question here, Mark, because I know we're really running out of time. Could you just comment on, and if there's not much to say, just just ignore the question. Um, anything you want to say about the NTSB and the regulator, other regulators giving him special treatment? Well, to be clear, the NTSB has been fantastic. The NTSB is not a regulator per se. They're, a, they're an investigatory agency. The regulator is, is, is the NHTSA, which, of course, has been a complete joke on, on Tesla. And to the point where, I don't know if you remember, but I think two years ago, the NHTSA actually called a press conference to call out the, the, the I'm sorry, the NTSB called a press conference to criticize and call out the NHTSA explicitly for not regulating the, the safety of Tesla's, you know, autopilot and full self-driving system, which was absolutely unheard of to, to air that in public. And look, there've been a couple of articles. There's a good guy who covers Tesla at the Washington Post who tried to figure out why the NHTSA has given Tesla such a free pass. And it sort of seems to come down to, according to him, sort of bureaucratic inertia and they've and, and a combination of that. And they've never had a, a, an openly defiant OEM normally, and this is in any industry in this country, normally a regulator makes a demand and, you know, you kiss their ass and you say, yes, of course, of course, because you want them off your freaking back, right? Well, that's not Musk. Musk is like, fuck you, make me. I'm not doing it. Fuck you. And that, and that's what he's done to everything, right? He did it about opening his, cl- closing his factory during right. COVID era in California. Right. So, um, you know, eventually something I think will happen there, but it, you know what? It may, it may happen through the, through the civil courts just from lawsuits or or a tesla will finally on autopilot you know run in god forbid run into a school bus right and then then all of a sudden has a role i mean two u.s senators at, on multiple occasions demanded that this be regulated right um the guy from yeah. connecticut right. and right. and the right. other one and right. nothing right. happened all right two more questions yeah. before i can let you go yeah uh, what do you think they're really going to earn 22 23 24 any thoughts uh, no, I have no thoughts. Uh, I can tell you this, that that be- because their earnings are bullshit. I mean, it, you know, it's two in the weeds for the time we have. But and I, but we've talked about it before. They 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 grossly under reserve on 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 warranty, you know, relative to expense. Um, for, there was a mysterious big drop in like SGNA this past quarter. Right. Which 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 makes no sense, even if you eliminate, you know, the, the reduction in, in stock comp, it, it made no sense whatsoever. Um, so, so the answer is, if you look at, if you look at free cash, oh, and, and, and I, you know, we think they're capitalizing all kinds of stuff. I mean, I mean, how do you open two new factories and have a, an SGNA reduction, right? So their, their accounting just stinks to high heaven, right? And, and by the way, you know, when you have a guy who's going to lie in absolute plain sight, about you know a fake takeover of the company or you know the capabilities of his full self driving when they put up that fake videotape with the painted black video which I think it's you know the, the stone on painted black I think it's still on the website they said the driver's not doing anything he's just there forever and then it turns out um, Ed Niedermeyer the, the the automotive journalist found out they actually spliced together a whole bunch of different cuts from like you know tens of trips in order to make one trip look seamless I mean that scam is still up there right so. My point is, if you, if that stuff is in plain sight, then how can you possibly trust what goes on behind the scenes with the accounting, where you really have no idea what what's going on and what's being capitalized and whatever? So, if you look at free cash flow, which allegedly is the hardest thing to hide, if you adjust free cash flow for um, emission credit sales, which are going away, they just booked a lot of them, but you know, within two years, nobody's going to need to buy an emission credit from Tesla because they're all going to have, and maybe sooner than that, they're all going to have enough electric cars of their own, right? And and even if they don't, everyone else will have surplus ones and the market will be flooded. The price will go down on 100%. them to nil. So so if you adjust for that, 
And then you adjust for like, you know, the way they stretch out working capital, like, you know, th like they stretch payables to the moon, you know, whereas, you know, receivables barely budge. You adjust for that. Their free, their free cash flow is like almost nothing. It's less than a billion dollars a year. All right. So, Martin, you know? one last question. Um, so, by the way, let me just say that yeah. if you have a billion dollars a year in free cash flow, you know, the, the the auto industry gets like a seven or eight multiple or something like that on that. I mean, if you gave Tesla a 20 multiple, it would be a $20 stock, not a $734 right, right, stock. Right, right. Plus, you're talking about the need for billions and billions of, of, of capital. It, yes. All right. All right. So three aces. One very short question, because <clears throat> we're, we're, we're well overdue. I'm, I'm, you're, I'm, I'm letting you be the only one that asked Mark a question because we're really short on time. Three aces, wow. good to see you. Do you, do you have a, so one question and that's it because Mark is doing overtime. So three aces, good I to see do. you. What, what, what's your question for Mark? Thank you very much, George. Hey guys. Hey, hey, Mark. Great, great, uh, great, great months last month. Returns. Congratulations. Oh, thank uh, you. Yeah, miles are <laughs> tough. Um, I'm just curious. When we talk about 20 million cars and all this other nonsense, can you just give <laughs> us a sort of quick uh, synopsis of? what the price points for these vehicles would have to be. I mean, you're very, very good at, at talking about, you know, price points of cars and reduction in prices and what that leads to in sales and things like that. Realistically, I mean, you know, how many cars in America are sold over 40,000 trucks and stuff like that? Can you give us a little color on that, please? Right. Well, I, I mentioned earlier, and, and I don't have the specifics, but I know – that when your cheapest car is forty-seven thousand dollars and your cheapest crossover is sixty-three thousand, you know you're into semi-rarefied air at that point, right? And th there's no way that they can th they can't sell five million cars a year, you know, if they don't have models that you can buy in the in the in, in starting in the mid twenty thousands and decently equipped in the mid thirties. They are so out of the reality. And and then if you couple that with the fact that they're electric cars, which is a niche in and of itself. So now you have a a, 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 a product niche and a price niche. I mean, forget it. It's ridiculous. Thanks, brother. I yeah, three it. I used to follow autos, and I don't have them to hand anyway, but as Mark was saying. But something like the mass market is like some huge part of the overall market. So it's all well and good for rich people in this room to not really be thinking about that. But once you get above like $40,000, it really starts to stratify pretty quickly. So that just, just reports gasoline on Mark's fire. Mark. And by the way, let me just, let me just say that, um, um, you know, the, 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 the particularly egregiously priced vehicle is that model Y is 63,000, you know, the, the, the Mach E and the Ionic five and the EV six are all, like they all start ten to fifteen thousand dollars cheaper, and at least for now, they all get the seventy five hundred dollar tax credit in this country, which is probably another reason why they're sold out further than the Model Y is sold out. So yeah, yeah. Mark, Mark, just remind me because I know they burned. I know they burned through the two hundred thousand thing, and then they changed the law. I didn't change the law. Is Tesla still getting tax credits on this? No, or and not? they they're not getting credits and. And they didn't change the law, and they're not going to change the law. I mean, Manchin killed that. All right, yeah, you know. I, I know they want. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Okay, fine. So if it's ten or fifteen thousand cheaper, and you're getting a seventy five hundred dollars tax credit, that means all in you're like seventeen or twenty two thousand dollars cheaper on those other cars. Is that what you're saying? Uh, uh correct. That's right. Got it. That's right. right. Yeah. Mark, you have been you. This has been one of the most electrifying rooms we've had. You have been unbelievably no pun gracious. Yeah. <laughs> Um, would you please come back? And I promise next time we'll get you in on time. We love, you know, and, and this is such a great back and forth. I've never, these rooms we have are incredibly special because you can see all the brilliant, we get speakers like you and the brilliant people that come into this room. It's just, it's just truly special. I'm just in awe of what we've been able to achieve here. And the best part of it is if it's just for one more second, we're doing this all in the name of charity. And if Carol Strone is there, she'd raise her hand, please. Um, she has an announcement to make. Go Hi, for George. It, Hi, everybody. So what a difference 11 days makes. 11 days ago, we were in another one of George's spaces, maybe at the five-hour mark, when uh, a friend in the room named Alexander took our breath away and uh, made a $50,000 matching gift pledge. Which means wow. at that point we were we had raised eighty one thousand two hundred dollars, 
And I'm happy to say that 11 days later, we have raised another 50 plus. So Alexander has to pay up. We have made the matching gift mark. And when he uh, has so kindly added his 50K to the pot, we're going to be at 182,000 roughly within uh, $18,000 of spitting distance of our $200,000 goal. So it's a huge thank you to Alexander and every one of the roughly six or 700 people who have donated and made this possible. That is awesome, Carol. Thank you so much. And Mark, the re- I mean, we're doing this. People are learning. You're teaching people. You're, you're helping combat financial illiteracy. People are learning. People are enjoying this. Hopefully you're enjoying it. Hopefully some of the questions. I'm sorry I didn't allow more people to ask questions, but we were jammed up on time because I didn't let you up here early enough. But Mark, you are giving back. I mean, you people like you spending the time in here. It's a mitzvah. You know, it's a kun alam. You're making the world a better place. This is just fantastic. So just know, Mark, that you giving up your time, you're really helping. You know, our charity is World Central Kitchen, and you're doing God's work. And so anyone and everyone who's been in this room, please, please, please give generously to World Central Kitchen. Um, Carol will repost the link to her Twitter feed. I'll do likewise. We should be t- through $200,000 within a week or two. And this is unprecedented. This has never been done in the history of, 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 of Twitter. And so this, can uh, I just put it in perspective with, uh, yep. with Alexander's gift? Once that comes in, we will have uh, served 36,000 hot meals to Ukrainian families in need. So it's, and then by the time we get to 200, I think it will be, uh, um, you know, for about 40,000 or, or more by the time we're done. That is awesome, Carol. Thank you so much for that. Mark, we're going to keep the room going for a little bit. You're free to leave, stay, do it, whatever you want. But thanks so much for coming, and um, we'll see you around again. Mark, hopefully you'll come to these rooms. It's not as a speaker, just as a participant, because there are a lot of really smart people in this room. Yeah, thank you so much. I am going to run, but I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. So that was just unbelievable. Um, and three aces, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, my brother. <clears throat> I've been so, so busy here, George. We talked earlier in the week about that. Um, I, just, I just wanted to put something out there for you and Thomas. Um, is it me or can, I mean, it seems to me when Huang got arrested, now we've got... Um, tiger blowing up um the whole kind of personality you know in those swang arrest docs and the pleadings or complaints whatever they are um the sec talked about that they have identified a pattern of trading in the market that is concerning and that there is a bigger investigation going on <clears throat> tom and george is it me or is has the personality of the way stocks are trading during the day completely changed. It it almost seems like the algos are there very quietly trading like they used to. And, and what I'm thinking here, maybe just maybe we're back in a market to where price discovery is going to be relevant again. And, um, and I'm just curious, has anybody else picked up on that or is it just a fan, a figment of my imagination? Thank you. So let's go to Tommy Thornton. And we're going to use that as a segue to have Tommy answer that question, as well as he's patiently been waiting. We had at the top of the at the top of the show. You weren't in the room, I don't think, for aces. We were graced with the presence of uh, Guy Serendulo and uh, Michael Belkin and Tony Green, uh, and we had a huge line. And, and so Tommy didn't have a chance to speak up. But Tommy, maybe you want to start. We use the Tesla leading question as a as a kickoff to maybe just a few minutes more generally what you're seeing going on. So Tommy, my good friend, good to see you. What's up? Hey guys, uh, can you hear me okay? I'm, I'm kind of. We're good. We're 100% on a, we're good. On a dock here in Connecticut. Um, okay, so, you know, I, I do think there's a lot more price discovery happening. And I have talked to a lot of different sell side uh, brokers and uh, buy siders, and liquidity is terrible, but everything has been relatively orderly, even with this, the large decline. So I don't think anything's really, you know, broken yet except for a couple of crypto issues out there as we know uh, but i i think it's been pretty orderly i don't i think today and a little last week we started to catch a little capitulation and i don't think we're going to capitulate on this downdraft that's 
kind of how I'm looking at it right now. We may, and I'm, I'm, I'll tell you my positioning. I'm sure everybody's going to love this. Um, I am, I've been covering shorts and scaling out of shorts and scaling into long positions. And I see market uh, S and P and NASDAQ bullish sentiment at 9%. I use the daily sentiment index data. That's low. That's the lowest um, reading. We had it actually last Friday, I believe or Monday, um, the last 3% down day. But that that's a low, 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 very low level. I'm also getting DeMarc buy countdown 13s picking up. And those are important when I see them not in just a one-off, but when I see across the board within the S&P, the, the, con, the components in the S&P have a ton of all buy countdown 13s. And on the S and P, we did get the thirteen today. There's another one called the the combo, and that would need a new low. And it's on day eleven of thirteen, and so we could have that on Friday, the thirteenth, which I, I I'd be so happy. But I'm leaving town, uh, so I'm not going to be in the office. And usually when I leave, it's there's always some sort of shit show that happens. Uh, but I'm positioned with a lot of cash. I've started to buy some stuff stuff that you know you might roll your eyes but i'm buying you know some of the mega cap tech names a little early but i'm i can scale into them i'm my max position size is five percent i'm buying two percent at a time and i'm not necessarily i'm, I'm more on michael belkin's side thinking that this is going to be a longer term issue and i think we're due for a bounce every one of my other technical indicators, I, simple ones like the seven-day moving average and the put, equity put-call ratio by to levels near, it'll probably be near um, the launch of 2020 and in December of 18. And I, so I'm wrong right now, and I, I like to scale into things, and I feel like we've got another bounce ahead of us. And okay, fine, we may be down, you know, the next three or four days. And it could be, you know, ugly, but I'm just going to keep adding to some ideas that are yeah, overdone. So, so, yeah. And so, not garbage, so, not garbage. Tommy, let me ask a question. I, I, I affectionately teased you the other day in a conversation. Yeah. I, I've told this story a couple times in this room. I'll say it again. I'm mean, actually, it's a compliment for you. Thornton called me in December of 18. It was just before Christmas. He went over to London on a business trip. He was sick as a dog from his from his bed in his hotel room. And he could hardly talk. And he was going on about these DeMarc 13s, and it's washed out. The market had gone down a straight line. And I hated you, Tommy. I just hated you because, <laughs> like, can't be, can't be. Are you telling me that your, your DeMarc voodoo is kind of lining up the same way right now? Yeah. Yeah, I am. And and I, I think it's I, I think it's a little scarier this time. Uh, I just don't think that beca partly because I don't think that many people are worried. Uh, you know, you had the arc analysts on Bloomberg and CNBC today. They're down 75 percent and they're making the case that if you don't buy our fund, you're you're anti innovation. And that, rolling them on is still says to me that this is going to take a lot longer. But look, I, I think we could get another bounce and look if i'm wrong i'll be the first one to jump on my sword take take losses i've had a great year so far so i'm you know i have the capital to put to work i've got a lot of cash and i'm not necessarily overly confident which i never am at some of these places so i'm i'm just kind of everything is sort of lining up here and i um uh, Yes, chopped chicken salad, Caesar. Yeah, hold on. I'll order my dinner. Um, so everything's starting to line up, and I'm watching for it. And it could come out of nowhere. I don't know what the catalyst will be. Um, I do think that is one thing on the CPI. I, I run DeMarc indicators just randomly on some economic data, and I tweeted out earlier this morning the monthly DeMarc on the CPI is on month, month 13, or excuse me, month 12 of 13. And I look at it going back 100 years, and bizarrely, these indicators happen up, upside and downside 
at pretty interesting inflection points. And it's a monthly, so it will take time. I do think, like Michael Belkin, that commodities could level off. And I'm not sure necessarily they're going down, but I think that they could level off. And, and that's sort of my, my view right now. And I've been hesitant to roll, roll into bonds, and I'm, I'm still waiting for a little bit more confirmation. But I think also, if rates go down, there's that algorithm that's going to say, oh, rates are going down. That's good for Shopify and Amazon and large cap tech and just bizarrely so. But I, I'm, I'm telling people, buy good quality on these types of moves down. Um, you, you may make more money buying ARC-like crap, but I think you're much better off upgrading your portfolio into higher quality companies at this point so i i'll be back um next week and you know remind, send one of those remind me in five days things on twitter <laughs> that's great tommy really that's that's you know it's it's you're a real pro and and it sounds like I, 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 you're on a dock i think you, you do go sailing so but we come at one of those places using the analogy from sailing and i'm not a yachtsman so excuse me if i use the wrong terms where we're kind of like coming about and you're at irons and you're not quite sure. You know, you're not going the other direction before, but you might be turning around going another direction. We kind of like at that crossroads right now. You think at least for a bounce? Yeah, I do. I, I think things have gotten really stretched. And and look, I'm I'm if you know me, George, and if people you do know me, I'm as bearish as it gets. I worked for a hedge fund for over a decade, and we were net short every single year, and we made money every single year, including. Well, 2008, we were flat, down a half percent. But regardless, I know how to navigate, you know, bearishly in bullish markets. And this is the type of thing, like John Roca said, where you get these rallies that can really surprise you and they come out of nowhere and they're sharp, they're bear market rallies. And so I scale into them. I don't have to, I bring a shotgun to these markets, not a rifle. I can't sniper this that precise but i can scale in manage my risk and try and get some uh, some alpha on the upside hey tommy are you all bothered by potentially just i mean given that the liquidity in the market sucks if the public really panics that we could just could have like a real uh, situation where the trap door just completely opens to the downside yeah totally i mean i have enough cash i've got it, Probably um, 35% cash, and I have some shorts, like shorts and a, a couple others, Tesla. Um, but yeah, that, that absolutely could happen. Absolutely. I don't, I don't rule anything out. I got it. All right. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 Tom, you're getting in the matrix a little bit. You're getting a little bit crazy on us with the thing. But um, so what you're saying is, I mean, you're, you're just you're just wading in. You're not all in. I just want people in the room to understand this isn't Tommy DeMarc, Tommy T Tommy Thornton saying, oh, the call, call clear, flying with both hands. I just want to make sure people understand what you're saying. Yeah, scaling in and upgrade to, to quality and things that will move when the market moves. Got it. Okay. All you, right. You, you don't need to buy value stocks here. You, you buy a lot of stuff that's been beat down that, that is not garbagey. 100%. That will be market leader type things. Okay. Listen, I'm out of here, George. Uh, awesome, awesome spaces, uh, everyone. Um, Thank you so much, and talk to you guys. Hey, Tommy, soon. Tommy, Tommy, last thing, last thing. Are you still running a special discount on your subscription service, Tommy? Uh, I think, I think you can. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you I, what. I had, I had one that said spaces. All right, all right. right, right hold on, off. hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm going to do you a special, right. Tommy. You didn't ask me to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to do. You're going to hit me for the next 24 hours. If you contact Tommy, if it doesn't link, doesn't work, and just use discount code George, he will give you a 20% discount. The discount code George. You got that, Tommy? Or okay, wait. we can make a okay, discount wait, hold on. code George. We can make, make a discount code A-hole if you no, want. No. Uh, <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> no, um, I, you, okay. Um, try, Whatever, try whatever discount in, you want. Um, Try putting in 2022 in the coupon code for an annual rate, and you'll get 250 off. I think that one's right. still All right, 2022. All right, so, so, so Tommy, so. just so people know, your, what your annual rate is – how much is your subscription, Tommy? 
Seven fifty. All right. So, so wait. Seven fifty. So and I put out three notes. You're offering two. Three notes a day. You're, off, you're offering two fifty off. So five hundred instead of seven fifty. Is that right? Yes. Awesome. For the first year. So I can tell you, I read his work every day. Right. I urge everyone else to do so. Good night, Tommy. Be with your bride. We'll talk to you. Be well. I'm I'm off. I'm off for a couple of days. So good. I'll be back good. Monday. I'll All be right. back. See you guys. I'll be back. All right. Uh, we're only going to do a few questions because we've been at it for two and a half hours. Um, if you got a question, raise your hand because I'm going to close this room soon. We're going to go to Andrea and then if three aces and Mark. Andrea, um, and then if anybody else on the stage wants to say something, be it Guy, three aces, or Newman. So, Andrea, the floor is yours. What's up? Hey, George. Hey, it's Andreas, but that's okay. No, no the problem, the problem is but, it's uh, abbreviated when I see it. That's why I say it. Right, yeah, okay. Go, go oh, on. it is? Okay. It, um, but um, to Tommy's point, I get there's going to be um, – like some bear market rallies. Um, the only thing I have a kind of an issue or what scares me is I don't like QT starting in less than three weeks, really. And so I think that'll just um, smolder everything. And I don't, I personally don't think it's priced in yeah. yet. And if you could take this, what, I mean, what's yeah. your opinion? Andrea, I don't think Andrea, we've Andrea, seen any of this. hundred percent. People should go look at my Twitter feed in the room on Saturday for the first time. You know, I've been bearish for a long time. People know that we were shorting arc going back last summer at 130. So I'm not one of these Johnny come lately's and I've been describing the market is offering return free risk for as long as I can remember little upside and a lot of downside, but I never use the word crash as because you predicting a crash is a fool's errand and normally it never happens. But for the first time on Saturday in the in that room, I used the word crash. And go look at my feed. I put out a, a thread on Sunday, and I retweeted it about why I thought the market could crash. And it has to do a lot with positioning. Retail is all in. They've hardly sold. Hedge funds have de-risked to an extent. But, but you know, there's still 45% net long. Like, it has that working out for you in this type of a market. The great Michael Kantrowitz, if he wants to get his butt in here, talk for a couple of minutes, as he's, as he's in the second row, so raise your hand, Michael. Um, as he's rightly pointing out, we're looking at a two-phase bear market. The first phase is just derating, higher interest rates giving lower PEs. So, you know, I'm gonna, I'm not as good looking as young as you, Michael, but you know, I think I got your, your shtick down pretty good now. Um, so I can probably channel my inner, inner Michael K. Um, you're looking at, a, at, a, at an economic slowdown with attendant earnings, to, earnings revision, down to earnings revisions and earnings declines. So you're looking at lower, in, in a world of higher volatility, you're looking at lower multiples on lower earnings. Enormous downside in the market. To your point, the Fed balance sheet has been growing. Oops, I shouldn't use that bomb. I'm sorry, two and a half hours in, it finally came out. They've been growing the balance sheet. Okay, albeit at a slower pace, but they've been talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk. And I think in a market which is illiquid as this one, if the retail heads for the hills, I just think the bottom can go out. So, so with respect to Tommy, I love him. And we challenge each other and, and we make each other think. And sometimes he's right and sometimes I'm right. For my money, when people say, so what do you got to buy? I got to put money to work. I hate that phrase. I got to put money to work. It's another Kramer bullshit stock broker economics thing. I got to put money to work. No, you don't. People say to me, what should I buy? I was like, well, wait a second. What if there's nothing to buy? And that's my view. So I'm with you. Like, it is a fool's error. Like, we will get counter trend rallies. There's no question about that. John Roke was not here today, but a great friend of this room. He's been in here a lot. Um, you know, he points out in the 2000, 2002 bear market in technology, when NASDAQ fell by 80%, the market was up on 46% of those days. So it just proves that trying to call the market on a day to day basis is a fool's errand. There were 10 counter trend rallies of 15%, 15 rallies of counter trend rallies of 10%. And, you know, shorts get caught and the market starts to bounce, you know, va boom, and up and to the right. Look at what happened last Wednesday when Jerome Powell said, oh, you know, we're not going to raise it 75. It's only going to be 50. I mean, the market exploded to the upside. It gave it all back and then some the next day, and it hasn't had an uptick since then. But anyone who thinks they can pick to call the market on a daily basis, all these geniuses on the halftime report or fast money or these these live trading rooms here on Twitter with free Discord services for $99 a month with geniuses who, you know, haven't shaved and have their baseball cap on backwards 
schooling Warren Buffett. Like, are you kidding me? Those guys have been carried out. And you want to know something? The reason I think it's got a lot more to go on the downside, we had a day last week, I think it was Thursday, the, the day after the, the, the Wednesday bounce. It was an all-time record inflow in by retail investors into the market. Things you don't see at bottoms. Kathy Wood, taking in money 10 out of 13 weeks. She's had net inflows this year. Things you don't see at bottoms. So the investor class, they're still kind of in denial about this whole thing. And, you know, again, as, as Walter Deemer said, I keep reporting, this is one of his greatest quotes. Markets don't bottom when people when 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 sentiment turns bearish. Markets bottom when it's when when people are done selling. They've hardly begun to sell, and the problem is the market is up so much, liquidity is so bad that I, I just think we're gonna. I think we're gonna have and listen. Whether or not we have a huge down day, five percent, ten percent in one day, that's not so interesting to me. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. But what's the difference between a market which falls, you know, fifteen percent in one go? Versus a market which goes down two three percent back and fill two three percent back and fill, and two two months later you're down fifteen percent. So I think to me to me even here, the market offers risk return free risk. In my view, the compression of multiples, and Cantor is going to. I should be careful. I say this because I got fifty fifty chance of being right on this one. But let's just put it this way. The multiple compression, you know, is only in line. I actually think it's, it hasn't kept up with, he's got the numbers. It hasn't even kept up with the increase in bond yields. Or maybe it has. But the point is, there's nothing in the price for an earnings slowdown and lower earnings. So I think, and then the idea of fair value. Like, what does fair value mean? Did value help us calling the top in this market? Hell no. It went multiple standard deviations beyond fair value. So why should prices stop at any notion of fair value, whatever that means? So I, I think, you know, you know, we had this, we, I, we cornered Cantro, and I'm going to make him say it again today, but trying to play mental gymnastics about where the market could go. Could go. And Michael, I'm going to shut up. It'd be really helpful if you go through that exercise again. Where earnings are now, where you think they might go to. What the, Hello? Yeah, where the, where the PE is now and where the PE might go to. So, Michael, the floor is yours. Uh, George, I need. I'm sorry. I need a minute. This, this, two seconds ago, my wife was calling me, so I, I'll, I'll jump back. All in. right. All right. All right. So sorry. All right. All right. Yeah, we'll, we'll, hey, yeah. George. George. One real, one real. Thanks. I mean, I think the same way you do, but then I think maybe the next shoe to drop, and uh, and then I'm gonna shut up. Is um what I you know looking at the 20 year treasuries. Let's say it drops, and then um. And these foreign countries start selling a lot. I think that may be the next well, one well, to well, go. Well, That's well, all well, yeah, you know, Andres, you raise a good point. I mean, we've talked about so many. You're a sharp cookie. Um, so right here, right now, in the very short run, I think the Treasuries had to sell less bonds. I'm talking like December. Yeah, I know, I know. But just let me let me finish the thought. Um, so right here, right now, because tax revenue is so high, they they have it on a monthly basis had to sell many bonds. But to your point, you look forward. The supply is going to explode, and if you're a foreign investor looking at our at our market, when the dollar is like through the roof, so you got currency risk, and we still have wildly uh, um, uh, wildly uh, expansive monetary, you know, rates are incredibly stimulative still now. They're well below inflation. Like now, I get there are certain governments, you know, whatever pension plans that there's their price insensitive buyers. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about a discretionary basis. As a foreign investor, like given the dollar, with the dollar where it is up on the roof, and rates still seriously negative, real rates, like why would you do that? Like you wouldn't buy our bonds, and that's what's happening. So you got the foreigners not buying our bonds, the banks buying less bonds, QE, which supposedly is supposed to become QT. Like I can't get from here to there. So I've I've made listen, I've I've consistently taken the over on 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 rates, oil, and the dollar, and that's been right so far. The only thing that's giving me pause on rates right here, right now, is, you know, if we break something right here, when the economy really falls out of bed, yeah, rates will go down. But the only reason rates are going to go down is if he breaks something. Otherwise, I, th I think, you know, much higher rates are on the card. So, Michael K., are you back? Hey, George, I am. I'm in my yeah, car. all right. So, but, yeah. yeah, so I don't know what part of that you want to attack. Maybe a good place to start would be, 
you know, where could the market go based on where earnings are, estimates are, where they might go, and where valuations are, and where valuations might go, and then talk about whatever you want. Sure. Um, you know, I think we're in a back-to-back bear market, uh, which we haven't seen in a long time. The current bear market is all about rates and inflation, like you laid out. And what investors have to think about is how much all that rise in rates and everything is going to mean for the economy and earnings, which is not priced in whatsoever. Uh, or it's just beginning to get priced in now as you're starting to see earnings estimates slash and companies miss, et cetera. So um, every tool we look at suggests the economy is not going to bottom until the middle of next year. There are, there are, the economy today is a reflection of policy rates, long rates, oil prices of uh, at some point six, nine, 12 months ago. In other words, we haven't even begun to really see the impact of all this inflation yet. Uh, and we will. It, it takes it takes time. Can, uh, can you hear me? Let's make sure. You sound great, Mike. Yeah, we, you yeah, we got you, Mike. Okay, keep going. So, keep going. Go on. So there's another bear market coming, and, and it's, we're going to go from the inflation and interest rate bear market to the earnings and employment bear market if things uh, head into recession. So um, – I wouldn't be looking for a bottom here. The only way I see stocks going up is if you get better inflation data, and today we didn't cut it. Um, it, it brought 75 bips hikes back on, back on the table. It was well above expectations. Uh, and, and it's not about it's going down or it, it's about does it change anything for the Fed? And the answer is no. If anything, it makes them more hawkish. So, um, you know, I tweeted uh, a couple days ago and last week saying that's the only – upside potential or risk to the markets and this cpi report didn't cut it earnings aren't going to do it better economic data is not going to do it you get better economic data that only pushes further the potential for inflation to keep staying high so uh, i want to comment on bonds can i talk about bonds george hello go for it michael k you can talk about whatever you want go for it so uh, I've been listening to Michael Falcon, who's fantastic, really enjoy uh, his consistency, his approach, his confidence. So thank you for introducing him to, to everybody and, and me, myself. Um, I, I looked after I was listening to your space, uh, this space earlier, and his conviction on bond yields made me go back to the drawing board. And so here's my view here on yields versus equities. Again, I think the bull case for equities, if there is one, and I think it's pretty damn weak, is that inflation softens, bond yields stabilize or soften, and stocks go up. I really don't see stocks going up any other way. Um, You know, what else is going to get PEs to go higher? Because earnings certainly aren't getting revised higher. And higher PEs or higher earnings estimates, the only thing that makes stocks go up. Uh, And that's a fact. That's math. It's just very, very simple. So... Uh, I do think that I'd rather own bonds here than stocks. Uh, and I say this after looking at what, I, what I'm going to talk about now. Um, and just the view, again, if stocks go up, I think bond yields have to go down. So if we, the market, S&P is down 17.9% today from its high. And Bloomberg makes it really easy to, to construct the drawdown analysis for any, any security, any asset. And so uh, I'll tweet this later. I, I just sent it out to our clients. So I don't want to push it too soon. Um, but if you look at the 12 times since 1970, there's, there's been 12 S&P drawdowns of at least 17.9%, which is exactly where we are today, 12 of them. Um, and some, you know, some of them end there, very few, and some of them get a lot worse. And the question I was trying to ask of the data is when we hit a 17.9% drawdown, what do bonds do thereafter? And in 11 of 12 of those, bond yields sharply fell. Um, and so that's a, it's a decent sample. It's not a great sample. It's not representative sample of today. I'll admit that. Um, but if you look, even look in the 70s, there's the one period where bond yields kept going up was in 1974 and stocks got crushed. And then shortly after, when bond yields peaked, 
the market bottomed. That was the bottom in that cycle. But it was also, importantly, the bottom in the economy. PMIs bottomed the same exact month that bond yields peaked. So you had everything going for stocks, better earnings numbers and lower interest rates. We're nowhere near better earnings numbers. I don't know if we're near lower interest rates, but I just thought, you know, it was a worthwhile exercise to do 11 of 12 periods when the market goes down this much. So if, you know, like Belkin was saying, if people just freak out and want to hide in bonds, I think it was Belkin, um, that's happened in 11 of 12 times. So just uh, food for thought. Thanks for that, Michael K. Um, really, really always good to hear from you. I learned so much listening to you. Uh, let's go to uh, Charlie Munger fans. Charlie Munger fans, you, you got a question? Yeah. G'day, George. You absolutely have nailed this since we last spoke, so it's a pleasure to listen to you. My pleasure. To you speak. You. We're, I'm, I'm in Australia. We manage it through a couple of billion. And um, one thing I'd say to the other gentleman's point, which he nails it, is between 1972 and 74, when you had CPI prints in 74 at 9%, then they went to 108 the market PE contracted to 8.7 times. So we're still on 15.6. And we, an excellent point, the margins haven't contracted and models haven't adjusted for higher WAC rates in these investment banks. So when that comes through, you know, you never get it. You get an earnings downgrade cycle. And we haven't, I think it was last quarter, it was at 76% of companies beat estimates. So... Uh, just defies logic and you've absolutely nailed this so thank you for your your counsel and thoughts on bringing this issue because arc you look at 30 42 numbers in their portfolio and if three of them are profitable then they could still halve again um yeah so it's just more an observation george you've been absolutely um nailing this so it's absolutely a pleasure I, I, to stay and listen to you speak you know probably for someone like yourself who's a professional Thank you for that. I mean, this is a hard business. It's very gratifying to to hear you say that. I mean, you know this business is hard. And, you know, it's only because I've made so many mistakes over 40 years. I've seen the movie before a number of times. And it's sort of like in sports, it's muscle memory. You start to recognize the play as it, as it <laughs> develops. And, and I've been there before. I've seen this. I've seen the behavior. I've seen the volatility. And you have to have seen it. You can't have read about it in a book. You have to have seen it. And um, as you can imagine, it was only with great depredation. Like on the weekend, we did a big space. Michael K was in there. I think you were in there. A bunch of people were in there. I, I don't want to scare people. I don't want to say, you know, be this bombastic, throw crap against the wall. It's going to crash. Like, what's the point of that? It's a stupid thing to say. It's irresponsible, frankly. Mm, 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 really, I'm overcome by the feelings. I just I couldn't shake why I mentioned it. And then I tweeted it out on, on on Sunday. And so I'm just so hacked off by the bullshit that's being handed out by the street and CNBC and Jim Cramer. And, you know, it's just it's complete lack of price discovery. It's number go up, bro. I don't care if it's crypto or the S&P or Tesla. It's number go up, bro. And, you know, you, again, th it was funny. We, I remember we were starting to go on this rant the other day. It's like, oh, you can't sell because, you know, if you sell, then you're going to have to pay taxes. If you sell, it's, you're going to have to figure out when to get back in. You know, if you sell, it's going to mess up your asset allocation. I love that one. All right. Well, mm. you know, imagine someone telling you that in March of 2000. Imagine someone telling you that if you're in Japan in December of 1989. Okay. These people are mm. irresponsible. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jim Kramer. Jim Kramer I mean, this is, there's this parody account. I urge everyone to go look at it if they haven't seen it. Inverse Kramer. It's it's hysterical. You 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 cry, except you can't stop laughing. This guy, try, it's Inverse Kramer. Everyone follow that. Everyone follow that Inverse Kramer guy. Basically, all he does every day, he, he, Kramer right, gives him his investing strategy. He takes, he takes Kramer's picks. And he does the opposite. And that strategy is killing it. I mean, it's time for it. We have, we have S-ARC. Let's try for an inverse Kramer REIT. Uh, sorry, uh, ETF. So, so I mean, Charlie, Charlie let me ask you, because I don't know how many years you've been in this business, but for where you sit, I mean, and again, it's not even so much 
What I'm really struck by is is tremendous downside risk. Nobody knows how much it's going to go down. What I'm really struck by is what Michael Kay was talking about. It's the que- it's the question of time. And as someone said on Saturday, I can't remember if it was him or somebody else, time kills more people than money. Because mm-hmm. that because when you when you get a bear when it's when the mental capital starts to get eviscerated, that's when people get ground down. And we haven't seen that. And Newman is in the room and he can talk about it in Japan, but I want to go to Michael Kay first. So 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 Charlie, how do you think about you know, yeah, how, much, very, very, how, much, how much do you think the market could go down? But more importantly, do you think it's going to be a short-term affair or do you think it's going to be more of a long-drawn-out affair, Charlie? It's a great great question. Um, if you think of your experience as well, 2000, it took uh, 23 months to the bottom to mark to bottom. Uh, and then you lost $1.8 trillion in the big top 20 names. And that took 17, that took effectively 14 years to recover. To your point on Japan, 99, that was 17 years of decline and still 30% from the peak. I mean, people probably forget the longevity of how long these things can go for when these things pop. I had pretty good experience to work with someone who's been doing this for 40 to 50 years and been through cycles. And this generation, which you've spoken of, George, hasn't experienced a proper drawdown. The drawdowns are generally average 37%. Munger has said, you know, I've had a three times 50% drawdown in my lifetime. And if you can't tolerate that, you shouldn't be in stocks. But people just don't know what they own. They aren't using traditional metrics of free cash flow, return on capital employed, and using price to sales, which is just not rubbish that uh, merchant bankers push. So uh, I can't say with a macro certainty of, of, of when this is going to correct or end, but I think people just got to be confident of what they're owning and understand those businesses and do you have a comparative advantage or edge in what you're owning here because um, many people are just buying hype and total addressable markets and it's all an illusion. It's not a profit pool and it's, and it's something that's going to crush a lot of people. Yeah, Char- so, yeah, Ch- Ch- Charlie, how long have you been at this? How, how many years have you experienced you have? Um, a while. Um, yeah, we, we, I'm in a family office in Australia and the gentleman I work for is probably right. one of the two. Top top twenty people globally in the in the world. Right. Works for another guy um, that was in top twenty globally in the world. So yeah, it's, it's it's just more learning from their experiences and trying to share insights and you know teach people. That's what this page is about that I have. Um, and like what you do, just educate people that they need to understand proper business. Yeah, I mean, aren't, aren't you troubled? Aren't you? And people mean well; they want to do good, but aren't you troubled by the sort of Lack of financial literacy. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I won't pick. On, I shouldn't pick on a stock, but I, 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 I will block. Not don't have a position. So just just mentioning. I mean, the company's losing two, three billion, uh, effectively a quarter. And the asset, and the write downs on the book are seven percent of the book, and they're writing one point eight spread. That's a business that could be insolvent. Needs to raise capital. I mean, people aren't looking at those things. Um, but it's right across the spectrum. I mean, you can go through every arc position. Yeah, Charlie, what stock is that, please? I'm sorry, which one? Um, block, so square, so square. Oh, square, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah but, but, but Charlie, you don't get it. You don't get it. The, 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 it's radical transformation. It's, it's democratization of finance. It's number go up, bro. <laughs> like and, and Kramer likes it. Like, like, dude, get with the program, man. I think the literacy is being dumbed down from use of EBITDA and non-gap earnings. Right, you've got to get rid of that rubbish. <laughs> so, as Charlie Munger says, EBITDA. Charlie, 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 you and me got to have a couple beers someday. <laughs> Whenever I hear non-gap and EBITDA, I just like I run, don't walk as fast as I can away from it. You hit, you hit the short side as quickly as you can. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, I'm sorry we got time zone. See I mean, it's really, it's really, really great. I'm glad you come. Anytime, you're always welcome in this room. It's just fantastic. So I really, really um, talk again enjoy soon. your time. See you, buddy. And, you're a good Yeah, day. and, and, and everyone, everyone should follow Charlie. I was looking at his Twitter feed. It's really cool. Um, it's just a, Charlie, you, you, you're, you're dedicated to promoting financial literacy. I mean, the stuff in your Twitter feed is fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, uh, George. Just trying to help people. And don't, we don't get stock, yep. stock promotions or things like that, just principles, you know? That's 100%, it. my friend, 100%. All right, buddy. All right, thanks, Charlie. Thanks, buddy. Michael K., um, you're up, and then we're going to go to U- URSLK, and then we're going to go to Jeremy. Michael K.? 
Uh, hey, George, I wanted to say three quick things. One, one in response, uh, unfortunately, I guess he left, um, just about the multiple. Um, let me just see where. Okay. So uh, totally agree. Multiple's got to go lower. Um, simple rule of thumb, when risks rise, multiples go down. And, you know, the risks are rising now because of interest rates and inflation, and then they're going to rise later because of uh, recession risks that are rising. And the multiple will bottom when those risks basically peak. I mean, it's it, looking back, it's obviously, you know, timing that is not easy, but um, that's the answer. And, and, and that's important to understand. It's not going to happen when the S&P is trading at 16 or 14 below average, above average. That's all that stuff is nonsense. Um, and so, in other words, markets don't bottom because they get cheap. They bottom because what, what made them cheap stops getting worse. So uh, back in the 70s, uh, you know, generally one thing I've, I've observed across different indices around the world is the more cyclical they are, the more financials, industrials, energy materials that are in an index, think of Canada, the cheaper it's going to be because it's got more cyclicals. Cyclicals are more risky. Index becomes cheaper, all else equal. And so uh, at the peak of the market's S&P 500's valuation uh, a year and a half ago, or a little longer, uh, financials, energy, industrials, materials hit a all-time low. This is going back to 1926 of 22%. That's when energy was 2% or might even broken 2%. Um, so 22%, um, lowest ever. In the tech bubble, those four sectors got down to 29%. And the point I want to make uh, back in the mid seventies, those four sectors were about 38%. So my guess is that you were also starting at a much lower multiple. Um, and, and I don't disagree with the gentleman. I just, you know, eight's not, not a magic number. I know we're at 16 or 17 now on forward earnings on, on pretend earnings, but, um, I'd just be cautious of using historical multiple troughs because you were dealing with different indices, uh, and, and again, it's not the level that makes the market stop going down. It's the risk ending. Uh, that was the first thing. Uh, second thing, you know, we, we, George, you love to talk about, and I enjoy listening all the time about uh, growth stocks that are s silly expensive, that don't have any earnings. Um, I'm not going to uh, repeat which fund because it's a, it's a client of ours, but uh, you and I have talked about this. Any stock today whether it's a value stock and more specifically a growth stock, you know, growth stocks that are expensive today, we know have a problem and it's rising rates that are resetting the multiple. But if you're a growth stock and don't earn any money, even if bond yields come down and assuming they come down because growth finally pukes and people panic, those stocks are not going to bounce because they're going to go from having an interest rate problem and a valuation problem to an earnings problem and a beta problem. Um, negative earnings, companies that don't make money do not do well when the stock market's going down and you're slowing down or you're heading to recession. So I don't think any fund that's got a lot of uh, expensive stocks that don't earn any money, and most of those stocks are in our short model, uh, are going to benefit from yields peaking whenever that happens. And, you know, and we're in yields down today. And you know, so uh, that's the second point I want to make. Uh, and the third one, this, this one may be a little outside of what we've discussed before, but George, you mentioned tax, tax losses or tax taxes. Um, and this is just something I want to throw on. If anyone else has heard anything about this, let me know. You know, you can't, you can't buy some, you can't sell something and buy the same thing within 30 days. It's called a wash sale. So you end up not being able to take those losses if you do that. Uh, someone, and I'm going to, I don't know if you're recording this. And so I got to say this carefully to make sure I don't get in trouble with uh, FINRA or the IRS. Um, there's a fund that somebody was telling me about in, uh, I think it's UBS and it's some kind of tax harvest loss fund. And I'm bringing, I'm reminded of this because you mentioned tax losses and the market's down a ton. Um, what this fund does and it's totally legal. It's a bit of a loophole, but it's legal. Um, you know, it, you can't sell the identical security. And I, the IRS kind of is not very explicit. You know, in other words, is the S&P the same as the Qs? If I sell the S&P and then buy the Qs, is that a wash sale? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. But what they do is something like that. You know, they, they own the S&P. And then like today, what they would do if the market's down 20%, they'd sell their S&P ETF and buy the 10 
uh, or 11 sector spiders. So basically maintain the same position, the same uh, allocations, but capturing that loss. So I don't know if you, I just thought of it, maybe thought of it, think of it, um, not recommending anyone try to cheat the IRS or anything like that. So, but, so, so Michael, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you feel a little bit better only because I happen to know something about this subject. Okay. If you were to sell an ETF to establish the loss and then reestablish the effectively the same economic position by buying the constituent parts, you can do that. Um, that's totally kosher. So, or, you know, if, you, if you're the, more, the simpler example, what I'm totally certain of, if you sold your, S, your SPY and bought QQQ, that's totally kosher. Well, so, I guess, so, so if it is kosher, what I'm asking you is, what was the point that the person who was telling you that story, what was the point they were trying to make? That's what I don't understand. The point, I guess, what they were saying is that, you know, markets correct, from, of course, from time to time. And when you have, you know, people have had big gains chalked up and they don't want to sell their equities because the tax loss are, and still, you know, are buying for the long run. If you sell now, I'm trying to think I remember how, how we did this, um, and the market runs back up to to your loss, you've right. taken that you've taken that out. Right, right. So beyond, I, beyond the loss, you still have to, obviously you're back in the, in the in the black. But if I sold today, twenty percent, the market's up twenty percent in the next six months, and I'm not saying that whatsoever. Sure, sure. Um, you've you've you're not paying any taxes on that twenty percent. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. Yeah, I mean, there's all types of games that, um, and it's totally a game. And just totally just made me game. think of it. Yeah, so, Michael, let me ask you a different question related to that. I mean, unless something changes, and you and I both think the market's going to be lower three or six, six months from now, we're going to be looking at just an unbelievable amount of tax loss selling, it seems to me. I mean, and you know the old strategy, you probably study for this, but I didn't know you then. I only met you in the last few months. But the old trick of, you know, you sell the losers into the – into the hole in the fourth quarter because the tax is selling and yep. you buy the stocks that are on the highs in November or whatever. So as you sit here right now, assuming that the market is at its current level or lower, what could you imagine? So fast forward, let's say the market's 10% lower across the board, you know, the, the, the world according to Noble and Kantrowitz, right? So we're coming up on the end of September and the economy looks like you think it's going to be and earnings estimates are going down, the market's drifting down 10%, and blah, blah, blah. So, like, if you were writing that strategy, I don't think compliance is going to get you in trouble on this one. But, but, but the piece you could imagine you're going to be writing then, like, what, what would that? It's a forward, it's a forward piece, so it's not a current one, right? Or, or put it another way, when we've been in situations like that before, but we've never really been this bad. But if we were in a situation where you had big unrealized losses and no sign of an upturn, I mean, wouldn't that suggest that you know, just to be like in a real accelerant on all the down stocks and get like totally smashed into the end of the year? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Just adds pain to, uh, to what's been underperforming. Um, I have studied that it's been, it's been a long time. Um, and then, you know, people, um, right. Corp uh, funds and corporations, mutual funds have different tax, fiscal tax, uh, or calendar tax periods, right. So that's October versus, um, cons uh, and maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, regular retail people, it's obviously the end of the year. So it doesn't always line up perfectly. And correct me if I'm wrong on that. I, but that's what I kind of remember one of the nuances of of the tax date. But yeah, if retailer if retail money dumps all all their losses, uh, yeah, and that's why you send, tend to see some weird stuff the first few weeks of the year uh, as well. You know, as people buy them back or um, look for the dogs of the Dow. You know, those the, uh, those stocks. The def definition of that is actually the stocks with the highest bond yields, but those uh, the highest dividend yields which are usually some of the worst performers in the prior year. I mean, Michael, you, you know, as long as hard to beat down things, I started cracking up before. I can't remember who was talking. You were somebody else. And they were talking about, well, you know, I mean, I think I mentioned the 2000, 2002 bear markets, you know, things went down 80%. And, you know, I think Belkin was rattling off, or Guy Serendula was rattling off how much more the market could go down. It could get really bad. It could go down like 60, 70, 80%. <laughs> I had to stop myself. I said, wait a second. And I, I said, Kathy's already down to 75. Like, what do you mean it's going to go down to 80? She's already down 75. 
I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 uh, and the, the factors, you know, the attributes of a portfolio like that, which is no earnings, pure future growth, you know, so no profitability except for three names. Um, that, that type of, you know, uh, I don't want to label it again, but that type of speculative stuff will, will do great when the market bottoms and the economy bottoms and, you know, every, the rising tide lifts all boats once again. But that is a year away at, at the earliest, and I don't know if that's going to be around in a year. And, and Mike, when you think about it, like, you know, again, the Abraham, the, the Abe Lincoln quote that I keep using, you know, it's much harder to, it's easier to fool someone than to convince them that they have been fooled. Okay. So these people in that fund, I mean, Kathy's done a brilliant job in terms of marketing. There's a narrative. Um, they believe in the vision. But, you know, time has a way of <laughs> changing people. And like when, you know, because they're still, they're still believe in the dream. It's a 69 Mets, you know, living the dream. But at a certain point, they're just going to get demoralized and they're going to start trying to head for the exit. So like, I just look at Ark as a ticking time bomb. I, I can't tell you. I mean, it's been a, it's been it has been it's been a ticking time. It has blown up and it's been great all the way down. But like, when do you think? What's it going to take for the investors in that fund to give up the ghost? I mean, what's it going to take for Kathy to finally get the redemptions? So we look at 130 factors, uh, all sector neutral across the board, and we look at sector neutral factors because. You, know, you don't want to just capture something that's happening because energy stocks are going up or because tech stocks are going down. You want to see market behavior across the board. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, the growthiest stocks with the weakest fundamentals are underperforming in every sector, not just tech. Uh, it's happening in small caps, not just large cap uh, growth. So it's happening across the board. Um, negative earnings is, is, is a factor that, you know, as you, as you would imagine, it just goes straight down. With the exception, again, of uh, roughly the first six months of any big market recovery or economic recovery. That, that's when, again, the rising tide lifts all boats. So, I, I, again, I think there's a lot more pain ahead looking historically at the performance of, negative, of stocks that don't make any money. And this is not a growth comment. This is also a value comment. And stock, and this, you know, George, you and I have talked about this. I don't want to own a company that doesn't make any money, whether it's value or growth or whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, they're all getting crushed. Um, and that's why, you know, we've talked about staying in the middle. Um, and so I think as their earnings numbers even get worse, you know, tech stocks all blew up in 2000 when five, when five year long term growth estimates peaked. That was literally the, 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 the data point that explained multiples. You, you saw stocks, um, the S&P 500, the long term earnings number went from like eight where it's kind of long term steadily there up to like 15 or 20 or something silly from 1995 to 2000. And it looks exactly like the NASDAQ. And it peaked in early 2000 with the economy. And it just went down. And that's, you know, it wasn't higher rates that blew up those stocks. It was, it was the, the, the end of growth and, 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 and all those estimates that, which were ridiculous went straight down. And so I think you're going to see that in these pipe dream growth companies as earnings estimates come down, it happens everywhere. Even even to the most uh, the least cyclical company, it's still going to feel some pain. And where a company's not making earnings for five, ten years, the, that factor in a bear market, and it's already happening, and it will continue, it just gets crushed. You know, you, who's jumping in unless people are calling bottoms, and that's not um, they're not buying that kind of junk. Um, so. I think it's it's an economic. I don't think rates will do it. Obviously, the performance, the numbers, down, was that stuff that's down to thirty seven now. Um, if people haven't jumped out now, I, I, I agree. What's what? What are they going to wait for? But I think it's when the general economic and earnings story really kicks in, and people are worried as much as they're worried about inflation and rates today. That they're worried that much about the economy, and that they are in, institutional investors that I speak with are, are not are not. Thanks for that, Michael. All right, listen. Um, we, Michael, I'm going to make an unusual suggestion here, just because um, if you want to run the room, we can keep running it. Otherwise, uh, or Mark Newman, if you want to run the room. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to close this room after answering two or three more questions because I've got to get on with dinner. Um, so 
Michael, I know you're busy. You may not have the bandwidth or Mark Newman. I don't even know if you're there. If either of you guys want to continue to run the room, that's fine. Otherwise, we're going to close it. We're going to do URS and then uh, Dennis. URS, good to see you again, my friend. What's up? Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Hear you perfectly. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. So I'm originally from Switzerland, but I don't ski and I don't yodel. I just wanted to share some experience that I have made uh, when I started in this business. So when I started, the, um, we started from an all-time high in the Dow, and we were down about 12.3%. And the Dow had a bad day, closed down 15 points, and closed at 936 so that was on April 2nd, 1973. And I just wanted to let you know how I it felt to, to go through this entire process before this entire move started in 1982. So the best thing that I saw was when the market went down about 6.5%, and that was uh, somewhere in October 1973 before it tanked. And it went down about 39% from when I started in the business. And then... Finally, we had a, <laughs> we we went up again, and that was somewhere in the vicinity of around twenty um, second of September of nineteen seventy six, and it went up about ten uh, percent. Then the market came down again, and uh, I had to wait again. And uh, at that time, the market went up about another 10%, and that started around the 27th of April, 1981. Then the market went down again, and finally, it made the low in August 19... Wait a minute, it went... Yeah, it was in 1982 when the market uh, finally made the low. The thing that I really wanted to stress is just how long it took until you saw a real bull market taking place and it was somewhere in the vicinity of 113 months. That's how long it took for the market to take off or for me to experience a real bull market. And the funny thing is, by that time, of course, you didn't believe it anymore. The other thing is, not only did you not believe it anymore, but because you always look for somebody to give you some guidance and really you know, knows a thing or two about what's going on in the market. You check with people that have been around for a long time before you. So the first time that the market or the Dow went up to that level was around May 5th, 1965. But those people that started then, they also only saw an increase in the value of the Dow of around 11%. And then we had a few other times when the market went up. And of course, it went up into the high on January 11th, 1973, before it really tanked again. So the people that I could orient myself with had a very bad experience also. So they didn't know anything. And they only had bad experiences. I had 113 months where I had bad experiences. And so by the time the market took off, you just simply didn't believe it. And you were always fighting what was happening the last 113 months or the last 18 years. And I just wanted to let you know that once you have a market that can really turn as badly as, you know, some people expect it might turn, the thing that really was killing people was the extent of time it took before the market took off. And at that time, Nobody really believed it anymore. It, it was just an out, it was just a crazy experience. The thing though is that I still remember two days that really stuck out to me. One was at the low in 1974 when I was reading an article by this guy Edson Gould, who of course was a real genius at his time in technical analysis. And he argued that 1975 will be a great year because there were no years ending in five that were bad years. I thought that was a brilliant analysis <laughs> because it just didn't make any sense to believe something like this. And, and, you know, I still remember when I was sitting at my desk and I heard the telex rattling and this information came in on the machine and you had, you know, to 
rip the, the page off to read all that stuff. It was just a really weird experience. The other time that I remember was when the market took off in August 1982. To the day I remember where I sat and I remember the weather. I remember the time it was when Volker lowered the rates. I think it was by 2% uh, that he lowered rates at the discount rate. Uh, I think it was, uh, it might have been August 13, 1982. But it was just unreal the time that expired between when you started in the business and I started right out of high school and started as an apprentice in a big international bank and how long it took until it really started to move. And I think if we were to go through an experience like this, I think very, very few people can associate with the pain that is associated with this non-directional movement that you have. There's only one other time that you had something similar. And that was in 2000 to about 2021. So I just wanted to share my experience that I had when I started in the business. And I was a trader on the floor sure. of the Zurich Stock Exchange. So that was in 1978. So I experienced when rates went way up and then way down. So you, so. Uh, do you want me to call you URS or URS or how do you like to be? It's 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 URS and URS. URS, URS, URS. Listen, listen. Your perspective is invaluable. Um, I want to do another space with you um, being the guest speaker because I think the story you just told is extraordinary. People can read about things in a book. That's no substitute for having lived it, you lived it. I want to thank you so much for um, saying that. Um, people need to hear from you. And I hope you will uh, accept um, an invitation to be the guest speaker um, in one of our future spaces, because your experience, your wisdom, your knowledge needs to be heard by everybody. So, Urs, I really want to thank you for that. Uh, and I hope you'll consider um, coming back and we'll even have you as a guest speaker. And, and we need to learn more about those times. So thank you, Urs. Thank you very much. Uh, Bobby J, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, so, Bobby J, I have to um, <clears throat> I have to leave. If you want to be co-host and run the room, that's great. Otherwise, I'm going to close the room. Yeah, uh, listen, I can't do what you do. Uh, you're, the, right. you're the Ed Sullivan. Okay. Oh, okay. So Bobby J, not to be rude, but I've already got my dear better half. I've been fighting her off to sit down for dinner. So I'm not even going to allow a question if you don't mind, because I just have to go. Yeah. Go um, okay. So um, this has been awesome. Uh, just, you know, we had such an incredible room today between Michael K, Tony Greer, and Michael Belkin. And guys, Sir and Dulo. I mean, I can't even remember all the all stars we had in here today. This turned out to be a barn burner of a room. And incredibly, we broke through. Um, we raised extra money. We need to trigger the $50,000 match, as Carol announced. We are uh, well into the 180s right now. Our goal is 200. And stay tuned. Um, you guys aren't going to believe what happened. So until next time. You're just going to have to wait. Any event, stay out of trouble, get off margin, be in cash. If you're crazy, go short. Again, the stock market represents return free risk. Do not underestimate how deep and how long this bear market might go. Whether it's Michael Belkin or Michael K or Mike Guy Serendulo or the others, all saying, coming to the same conclusion, but from different perspectives. For me, there's serious information content in that. So, Thank you all for making this room so very special. We continue to have the best rooms on Twitter, period. We have the best content, the best speakers, the best moderation, if I don't say so myself, and the, the most intelligent audience. And so it's very, very special. I just I just pinch myself. I watch all you guys. I see you, you know, Urs, we have a new star here. Urs, you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna be asked to speak one of our upcoming rooms and Michael K again, I can't thank you enough. You're helping teach people. This is awesome. So with that, we're going to close the room and they'll probably the next one will be on the weekend. If you guys call me for an emergency room tomorrow, oh yeah, I don't have a lot to keep doing this. 
Last week we did three three rooms in a row. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I put it this way: if you guys want a room tomorrow, I think the market's got to be four percent down for me to do it. Otherwise, I'm just not going to do it. Um, so anyway, enough of that. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. Be well. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks, George.